Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you be seated, please. My name is uh, Stanley Zlotkin. I'm the Chief of Global Child Health here at the Hospital for Sick Children. It is my great pleasure to chair the 2019 Canada Gairdner Global Health Symposium. Welcome. In preparing for today's event, it was news to me that about 14% of the global burden of disease is attributable to mental disorders. Even in Sub-Saharan Africa, where communicable diseases are common, mental disorders account for about 10% of the burden of disease. Mental disorders are linked to many other health conditions and are among the most costly medical disorders to treat. Certain treatment and prevention strategies for mental disorders are known to be effective, even in low and middle income countries, particularly those associated with depressive and anxiety disorders. However, however, health systems around the world face a scarcity of financial resources and qualified staff, a situation that is often compounded in low and middle income countries by a lack of commitment from public health policymakers and inefficient use of resources. As a result, measures known to be effective for dealing with mental disorders are often not implemented. The World Health Organization includes mental health as a, as a priority in its Mental Health Gap Action Program, which aims at scaling up services for mental, neurological, and substances use disorders in countries, especially low and middle income countries. We have a full schedule for today, and on your desk is a uh, biography of the various speakers, who will focus on community-based mental health interventions from global to local. To save time, I would encourage everyone to read your brochures. Before introducing Dr. Rassant, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which Sick Kids operates, for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat and the Peyton First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, Toronto is home to Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Sick Kids is committed to working toward new relations which include First Nations, the Inuit, and Métis peoples, and is grateful for the opportunity to share this land in caring for children and their families. I'm now very pleased to introduce Dr. Janet Rassant to open the day and to welcome our distinguished keynote speaker. Janet is a senior scientist and chief of research emeritus at the Hospital for Sick Children and president and scientific director of the Gairdner Foundation. She is an internationally recognized developmental and stem cell biologist who led the research institute here at SickKids between 2005 and 2015. She has received many honors and recognition for her work, including the 2018 L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Award, five honorary decrees, and election to the Royal Societies of London and Canada and the National Academy in the USA. Welcome, Janet. Thank you, Stan. As ever, it's a pleasure to be here at SickKids and to attend and welcome you all to this uh, Global Health Symposium. It's become a tradition now to work with the Centre for Global Health here at SickKids every year to have a celebration of the work of this year's Canada Gairdner Global Health Awardee. The, new, the award has been around for about 10 years now, named now after our previous president, John Dirks, who is here today. It's the John Dirks Canada Global Health Award. And it really celebrates people who have made major contributions to research that's had impact in the developing world. And it's rapidly become one of the world's most prestigious prizes, uh, recognizing excellence in global health research. So the Gardner Foundation, for those of you who don't know, you really should know, so I'm gonna say, if you don't know, you should know. The Gardner Foundation has been around for 60 years. It's our 60th anniversary. And our goal is to recognize excellence in health research internationally, research that's had impact on human health and well-being. And it's also to use those prizes and the recognition to convene leaders as we are today, and also to reach out to the next generation. And our laureates, seven of them, are all converging today, I hope, uh, in Toronto, because tomorrow they will all present their laureate lectures and we have a gala where they'll receive their awards at the Royal Ontario Museum. It's a great party. But what they've been doing this week is traveling across the country, visiting universities, talking to faculty, talking to students, and also talking to high school students about their careers and the, the joy 
of research and the impact it's going to have on all our lives. And Dr. Patel has been no, no exception. He's been busy this week in a number of different places. Uh, and I think, I hope he's not too tired and ready to go this morning. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Patel. He really is a worthy recipient of the John Dirks Canada Global Health Award for 2019. Uh, he's receiving the award for his world-leading research in global mental health, generating knowledge on the burden and determinants of mental health problems in low- and middle-income countries, and pioneering approaches for the prevention and treatment of mental health in low-resource settings. And indeed, his work, mostly in India, really resonates much more broadly, as we're going to talk about today, as we struggle everywhere with access to mental health treatments and the need for innovative solutions, especially in low resource settings. And that's really going to be the focus of this, this, this symposium and, and uh, discussions today, the concept of how we can take uh, low uh, uh, community interventions in all sorts of environments to really tackle the major problems of mental health. So I'm not going to read his bio, you have it in front of you. He holds many different uh, positions, he is currently the, the Pershing Chair of Global Health at Harvard Medical School. He also has a position at the uh, London School of uh, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He is a Wellcome Trust Senior Fellow, and he founded Sangath India, which is a, the NGO that has really has worked with to really look at how to implement these community interventions. So it's a great pleasure and a great honor to welcome <laughs> Dr. Patel to tell us about his research. Uh, thank you very much, Janet, uh, and thank you, John, uh, for having, uh, you know, shepherded this program of uh, honoring people like myself. It's a tremendous honor, not just for me, but I think for many of you in the room here who have worked tirelessly in the area of mental health, which is the quintessential global health subject because every country has failed. Um, I think uh, uh, one, of the, one of the most um, remarkable experiences of the last two days uh, with the high school and graduate students that I encountered, particularly the high school students yesterday in Ottawa, uh, was how immediately they connected with conversations on mental health. It wasn't about some other country. It wasn't about some distant, faraway place. It was about themselves, their neighborhoods, their classes, their colleges. And, uh, um, and I think that in itself unites the world uh, perhaps sadly because of inaction and failure, but also perhaps, as we'll see in the session today, about opportunities to learn from one another. Uh, what I'm going to give you is my lecture that I've actually planned for tomorrow, because I understand many of you will not be there tomorrow, uh, and it, it's also a nice way to do a trial run uh, of, uh, of what I'm going to do tomorrow. So uh, it's really a very personal account of my work uh, and where where I came from, where I started, and where I hope to be going uh, in, in the latter phase of my career. So a good global health researcher must begin with a map of the world. Um, so I should first of all say that I, I started my journey in, in Mumbai, in India. Um, and apologies if the images aren't big enough, but essentially what that shows is the King Edward Memorial Hospital, very nicely named, as you can imagine, for a post-colonial country. Um, I see a lot of these signals here in this country too, all kinds of kings and queens everywhere. Um, so this was actually one of the best medical schools in India at the time, one of the schools in which you really had to compete very hard to get in, I assume like UFT is. After I finished my undergraduate medical degree, I uh, got a Rose Scholarship that took me to Britain. And after finishing a higher research degree in Oxford, I then moved on to this particular hospital called the Maudsley Hospital. Any of you who are psychiatrists would immediately recognize that this is often considered to be the mecca of psychiatric training. So up until now, I had only experienced psychiatry in a very, very rarefied uh, setting. Uh, two of the world's greatest medical schools uh, where there were plentiful human resources and everyone worked in a highly specialized context. I then, thanks to Wanderlust, found myself in Sydney. And here was my first exposure to global mental health. Uh, it wasn't called that then, but in what way? Well, I found myself as a psychiatry senior resident working not in the glitzy opera house end of Sydney, but closer to the Blue Mountains in a neighborhood that curiously, and was curious at the time, and I discovered later why, was called Blacktown. 
As I started doing the emergency and outreach work in this neighborhood, I discovered that the residents of this particular area were very different from the residents who lived in Wulumulu and all the other lovely parts of Sydney. These were all Aboriginal people. Um, and I also discovered that there was a very high prevalence of mental health problems, substance use and self-harm, and that the etiological models that I had been taught so well at the Maudsley Hospital really struggled to explain this collective high burden of mental health problems. And I started reading and delving deep into the writings of great uh, psychiatrists and anthropologists like Ernest Hunter, whose book is shown here, uh, and discovering really the whole notion of historical trauma. This was, of course, not anything I had ever been taught about in psychiatry, because in psychiatry, we were only taught about the individual's biology, genes, and life experiences, not the fact that individuals belong to cultural and social groups that sometimes inherited through mysterious mechanisms, traumas that their parents and even further back in their ancestries had experienced. It was eye-opening. I then moved on. Wanderlust took me to Zimbabwe, where I spent two years in the University of Zimbabwe Medical School, where I also completed my PhD. And here, again, I was confronted with a completely new reality that I had been not at all prepared for. Here I found myself as one of 10 psychiatrists working in a country of 10 million people. Um, there were more psychiatrists, I often remark, in the corridor of my office at the Institute of Psychiatry in London than there were the whole country of Zimbabwe. Um, and nine of us worked in the medical school, which effectively left one psychiatrist for nine million people. And so what that really taught me now was that everything I had learned at the Maudsley Hospital, I had to now park aside and reimagine reframe, rethink how one would deliver mental health care where there were basically no mental health professionals. This is the beginning of my journey in global mental health. It wasn't called that then. And then I moved on back to India, where in 1996, I co-founded a non-governmental organization, Sangat, uh, uh, in Goa, where now, of course, it works in many parts of the country. And Sangat has really been uh, the effector arm of almost all the important research I have done in India particularly in partnership with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which then appointed me as a professor, thanks to the Wellcome Trust, um, and where we set up the Center for Global Mental Health, which will celebrate its 10th anniversary next week. Through the Center for Global Mental Health, I had the good fortune of expanding my footprint back in Africa through, first of all, Eugene Kinyanda, my mentee, who now celebrates 12 years of leading what has now become the most a prolific program of research on HIV and mental health uh, from the Makerere University. A few years later, I was fortunate to be awarded a large grant with colleagues in South Africa uh, to lead a five country program called PRIME, uh, which sought to work directly with ministries of health in these five countries to learn how one could implement a clinically proven interventions in routine care for a whole range of mental and neurological conditions. And then two and a half years ago, I finally moved to where I am currently based uh, at Harvard University, where I now spend about half the year and the other half with Sangat in India. So I'll be trying to tell you in the next 25 minutes or so, really a whirlwind tour of what I've learned through this, this long journey over the last two and a half decades and where I'm hoping to go in the next decade. When I started 25 years ago, the most important things uh, that I can remember is that no one really cared about mental health, especially in the global health context. On this slide, you can see some of the sorts of questions that I was posed, for which I had very few answers at the time. For example, that mental illness was a complete cultural construction of Western, white, rich, affluent, urban people, and had really no bearing on anyone else. Um, in fact, interestingly, I myself used to carry very similar thoughts when I set out in Zimbabwe, particularly after my Australian experience. Uh, I, I really began to interrogate the very nature of the way we understood mental health problems. I was also armed with a, a lot of great learning and reading from medical anthropology at the time. Related to the same idea was the idea that we had medicalized what was essentially a social or political problem. Um, that this was not a priority for poor people or poor countries who had more important things to worry about. For example, their physical health, infectious diseases, or indeed most socially important things, for example, their housing or food. And that ultimately there was no prospect of us addressing mental health problems in poor countries because the prevailing idea of mental health care was people sitting, very expensive people sitting in very expensive hospitals, delivering care for many years with quite uncertain results. 
So I set about interrogating all of these different ideas, partly to convince myself actually whether or not these were actually genuine concerns or whether perhaps science could show us otherwise. And in the next few slides, I'm going to just summarize some of the key examples of research that I have been involved with or led uh, that really sought to address some of these ideas. The first was the relevance of mental health problems across different cultural contexts. My work has spanned a variety of different methods and approaches. And in this paper, for example, I describe how traditional medical practitioners in Zimbabwe understood mental health problems. I work extensively with ethnographic and qualitative methods to understand the lived experience on these two papers. We describe, for example, the lived experience of depression in mothers. And in the second paper, the lived experience of having suffered horrific trauma, in this particular case, um, the victims of the terrible pogroms that were conducted in Gujarat uh, in the early 2000s. I was also very interested to work in some of the poorest countries of the world, in this case, Mozambique, which at the time was the poorest country in the world that had just been coming out of a protracted civil war and working with the ministries of health to understand how psychosis, intellectual disability and epilepsy were recognized and managed uh, in the poorest communities of this very poor country. And research that also examined the lived experience of families that, was, that were living with a person with a mental health problem and discovering, of course, the profound experiences of stigma and discrimination. The second kind of research uh, uh, inquiry was really about connecting mental health with other global health priorities. It was clear to me that if mental health in and of itself was not going to be an important form of suffering, then maybe I could understand better how mental health and physical health were connected to one another because physical health seemed to have no such challenge. So my work began initially by looking at the relationship between depression in mothers and the health and well-being of their newborn infants. Our work in Goa was the first study of its kind that demonstrated the very large effects of maternal depression on infant stunting and undernutrition, a subject that I spoke about a lot when I was here a few years ago at the Global Health Symposium at Sick Kids. This work has now been replicated in dozens of countries, and today it's a well-accepted fact that depression in mothers is a modifiable risk factor for one of the leading global health priorities, which is infant stunting, but also for poor cognitive development in, in, in newborn children. I've also worked extensively on other aspects of women's health, for example, obstetric complications and child loss uh, at childbirth uh, and its impact on women's health. And this particular one may surprise some of you here, which is the relationship between women's reproductive and sexual complaints and their mental health. And to give you a bit of context here, way back in the late 1990s, as the HIV AIDS epidemic was sweeping the world, there was a real concern of very high burden of sexually transmitted infections in women in South Asia because of the very high frequency of complaints complaints that people, clinicians, thought were related to STIs. I was baffled by this because it didn't seem to make any epidemiological sense, and so we began a large program of work to unpack the etiology of women's sexual complaints and finding, of course, that there was absolutely no connection with sexually trans transmitted infections, which were vanishingly rare. Um, and yet we were labeling these women with these highly stigmatizing conditions with profound implications for their marital relationships. We found clearly that these were actually culturally determined complaints uh, that were linked to very difficult personal lives, interpersonal violence, and frank depression. My colleague Eugene has built a very large program of work showing that HIV and mental health problems are inseparable, that any program of work that seeks to address the quality of care and life of people with HIV that misses mental health is actually missing a very important part of person-centered care. More recently, I've turned my attention to chronic diseases, particularly cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And in this piece of work, we were able to show from data from 60 countries that the comorbidity of depression with cardiovascular disease or diabetes exponentially increased the levels of disability uh, and impaired quality of life. And of course, one of the very important drivers of global health priority setting is mortality. And it would be fair to say that many global health priority uh, makers, uh, decision makers would challenge me and say, shouldn't we really prioritize diseases that kill before diseases that disable? It's a Faustian choice, really. But I could not agree with them. Of course we should. And so I also started interrogating, do mental health problems kill? And of course they do, as we showed in this first national representative study actually conducted with a Canadian colleague, uh, Prabhat Jha, 
which demonstrated uh, that suicide was the leading cause of death in young Indians. This has now been something that's been replicated many times, not just in India, but actually in many other countries. The third kind of question that I was challenged with is, are mental health problems relevant to poor people or people who live in socially disadvantaged settings? So here I began to address the question of the relationship between established social determinants of poor health that global health considered of priority and examine how these were affecting the mental health of people. One of my earliest studies in Goa after I returned to India from Zimbabwe was, and this was actually quite provocative, actually placing the words poverty directly on the front page of an article, not just social deprivation, social, just straight on poverty. Because poverty was something, and this is absolute poverty, um, was something that global development and health considered a driver of decision making for resource allocation and demonstrating that absolute poverty was a profound uh, a co-traveler for poor mental health. Gender inequity was another very important, well-recognized driver of global health priority setting. And in, the, in this piece of work, we demonstrated how women's particularly disadvantages situation compared to men in India could not be separated from poor mental health. Violence, interpersonal violence, partly uh, uh, due to gender disadvantage, but also independent of, particularly in the lives of young people, uh, was another major focus of my work. And of course, it's become incredibly relevant globally today as we witness the rising suicide rates uh, in young people uh, in, in all countries, including uh, in, in, in North America. But another kind of way in which I sought to connect social determinants with mental health was to examine the economic consequences of, of, of mental health problems. And in this piece of work, we really compared healthcare expenditure uh, for people with depression, these were all women, uh, and compared them with two conditions that were well recognized as priority conditions in women. Again, reproductive and sexual tract infections and anemia. And we're able to show that of all these different conditions, depression alone was associated with massively increased healthcare costs and indeed catastrophic health expenditure. And of course, the reason was very clear. When these women would go to their clinics, they would get inappropriate or inadequate care and they would start shopping for doctors, landing up in the private sector, having numerous investigations rather than empirically supported uh, care. So through this body of work, largely epidemiological and qualitative work, we were able to demonstrate that these were real causes of suffering in very diverse contexts, that there were profound impacts on health and social outcomes, and that due to mental health problems, we had a vicious cycles of disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Now you think that this should be sufficient for people to act. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately it wasn't. And I had this very wonderful memory of sitting in a room just like this with a, a except that they were a very unfriendly uh, group of World Bank economists, um, who then essentially said, all of this is very good, Dr. Patel, but we still don't care because there is no way we can really address these problems in low resource settings. Thus began a second phase of my research career, now beginning to actually ask the question, can we actually address problems in places like Zimbabwe and India where we simply did not have mental health professionals? Could we reimagine how we can reorganize clinically supported interventions to be delivered by human resources that are actually available rather than those that we can only dream about? And of course, the human resources that are available are ordinary people or ordinary people who have become the frontline workforce in healthcare systems around Africa and Asia, and increasingly are now not see also in the US, as we'll hear about later on this morning, uh, ordinary people who have been skilled up to become community health workers. For me, this has been one of the most exciting areas of work in global health, not just global mental health, but global health. The demonstration that we can deliver effective interventions in the hands of less trained people, less expensive people, people who are not likely to get on a plane and migrate somewhere else the moment they have their MDs, people who are gonna be embedded in their communities for the rest of their lives. Over the last 10 or 15 years, working with a large group of collaborators in Sangat, we've been able to demonstrate the effectiveness of this approach to support families affected by dementia, families and individuals affected by chronic schizophrenia, families affected who live with a child with autism, 
people with severe depression, and this is a very exciting novel area of work for me, which is redesigning the interventions themselves. So this is really much more blue sky work where we even redefine the clinical interventions. And I'm thrilled, not only that this particular trial was replicated in a separate group in Nepal, uh, but that Daisy here, uh, who worked with us uh, very closely on this program in India, uh, has been able to secure a large PCORI grant to be able to use similar ideas of brief behavioral activation treatments for the management of maternal depression where here in Canada and in the US. Alcohol related programs led by my, uh, my colleague Abhijit Natkarni, who will talk more I'm sure about this later on this morning uh, and working probably one of the few examples where we in India have been able to work with colleagues in Pakistan, um, both for autism but here with maternal depression. Indeed, this evidence base is so substantive today that we have a number of systematic reviews. Uh, these are just some examples of the systematic reviews that my younger colleagues have been able to pull together uh, that demonstrate the effectiveness of this incredibly exciting approach uh, to deliver care in some of the least resourced parts of the world, both in high as well as in low income countries. And I think what this evidence really tells us is that with imagination, with creativity, we can deliver mental health care in some of the least resource parts of the world. More recently, I've turned my attention to prevention. Um, these two trials that were published just last year uh, demonstrate that we can use similar approaches uh, at, at the individual level. The first study really was working with older people who had risk factors for poor mental health, for example, older people with chronic painful conditions uh, and disabilities. But the second piece of work is actually, for me, very, very exciting because here we were not working with individuals, but with environments. Uh, and increasingly, as I work with children and young people, I've discovered that it's not just working with the individual child that, or young person that's important, but actually refashioning the whole environment. And this particular trial really aimed to change the social environment of schools. And I can certainly talk more about that in the panel discussion. Uh, what was really exciting about this trial was that Unknown to me, at the same time that we were working in this completely new theoretical model, converting a pragmatic intervention derived out of social theory, a similar program was being done in England. Um, and I only discovered that a very similar program or trial was being run in England when my PhD student, Sachin, who led this program, was examined by the PI of the, uh, of the English trial. Um, both the trials were published in the Lancet on, in the same issue in October last year, uh, and both of them had the same social theory, delivering in totally different school systems, totally separate teams of investigators with exactly the same results. And so if ever there was a way to demonstrate the, uh, uh, the validity of a social theory that proposes a mechanism uh, for mental health problems that lie in the environment, you couldn't think of a better timing for these two trials. We're also learning to integrate, but this is, of course, a much uh, longer story ahead, uh, how to increase demand uh, for mental health care in some of the poorest communities of the world, and how to integrate, and this is the work that I've done with colleagues through Prime, integrate uh, these complex interventions into routine uh, uh, healthcare contexts. Through this body of work, it would be fair to say the global mental health research community has completely redefined the composition of mental health care, going beyond narrow biomedical clinical interventions, making care available to people regardless of whether they fit a diagnosis or not. Where interventions are delivered so that they can be delivered pretty much anywhere in the world, any, in any community, in any setting, including at home. Who delivers these interventions? Re recognizing that a range of different providers with adequate training and supervision can actually provide at least some form of mental health care, uh, and that these are models that require collaborative and coordinated care. So I want to stress this is not about replacing the specialist, but expanding the reach of mental health care into populations that have historically never been able to get to them. This kind of evidence has had a profound impact in in, 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 in leading to the birth of what I consider one of the most exciting disciplines of global health, focusing on reducing disparities in mental health care and outcomes in all parts of the world. We've been able to engage as a broader community, and here I'll talk a little bit about the communities that I've engaged with, uh, to make this science available and adopted by other stakeholders. And of course, the mental health field has many stakeholders that we must connect with. For me, one of those stakeholders is the Academy of Global Health. Through work with The Lancet in particular, which has been a real champion uh, of, of this field, 
through working with the NIH and other funders, in this case, the grand challenge of global mental health uh, that I co-led the scientific advisory board, and through working directly with, uh, with, with education, in this case, for example, the masters in global mental health that we set up in London, and this is the textbook that is used by our students. Engagement with policy and practice is central if we're gonna get resources allocated and we're gonna get frontline providers engaged with adopting the science. I work closely with the World Health Organization to develop a clinical treatment guidelines for primary and secondary care providers. The Mental Health Innovation Network that was set up thanks to a grant from Grand Challenges Canada, which is now the largest repository uh, of innovations, uh, both in rich and poor countries that demonstrate how mental health care can be delivered. My own manual that was designed for community health workers, a clinical manual, which is now in its second edition, very much souped up with all the clinical trial evidence that we now have. My work with the government of India to draft its first national mental health policy and with global policy makers, both in the World Bank and the World Health Organization to really understand better how governments can adopt and scale up these evidence-based interventions. But the other stakeholder that I think is profoundly important is civil society. And I wanna circle back to my own years in Zimbabwe because during that time, uh, we had a pandemic that was sweeping Southern Africa. Never had I seen so many people die on a psychiatric ward uh, as I did in Zimbabwe. But of course, they were dying of AIDS. And I can still remember very vividly uh, sitting in my, in my psychiatric ward with my colleagues and being utterly demoralized and depressed. Why? Because we knew there were life-saving treatments already by the mid-1990s. If you were living in North America in the mid-1990s and had AIDS, you would still be alive today. But about 10 million Africans have died uh, because public health scientists squabbled over whether African healthcare systems could afford these medications and whether the healthcare systems could deliver them. The reason we changed was not only because of science, the science actually already existed. It was because of the moral argument. And that moral argument was led not by scientists, scientists supported them, but it was led by people who had uh, the experience firsthand of AIDS. And I've really realized that if we're ever going to translate our science into action on the ground, we have to work as equal partners with people with a lived experience of mental illness. And so that was really uh, the, the, the motivation uh, to support the launching of the Movement for Global Mental Health 10 years ago. And last year, in fact, the movement, which is led by a South African woman who has schizophrenia, launched a global network to unite or to network or support people with the lived experience of mental illness to become equal partners in designing, delivering, and holding care accountable. More recently through Sangat, we have been working extensively with young people uh, who of course embrace the idea of mental health as being a central part uh, of their identity much more than any other demographic, but who are also affected by mental health problems the most. Friends, I think this large body of science and a lot of it is done by many colleagues and collaborators working in very different and difficult settings around the world, is in part responsible for the final recognition of mental health as one of the key health targets in the sustainable development goals. For me, this might be a moment to think, should I hang up my boots and retire to the beach and go? But unfortunately, I have to take a reality check. Really, what is the truth on the ground? The truth on the ground is pretty dismal. This work from last year's winners uh, of the Canada Gaidner Global Health Award demonstrates that no matter which country you live in, over the last 25 years, the burden of mental health substance use disorders have risen by more than 50%. And this is not only because we have failed to act on mental health problems, but also because we've done pretty well with many other health conditions. During this period, mental health problems have become the leading cause of death in young people. Last week, the US CDC released astonishing data that report that in the age groups of 10 to 24, suicide mortality rates have doubled in the last 10 years. And I often sit back and think, if this had been any other health condition, let's say, for example, breast cancer, the rest of the community would have stood up with outrage. And said, how can this happen in 10 years in this phase of human history. I haven't seen a single report from anyone who remarks on the outrage that we're seeing these figures. Of course, there's outrage about substance use, uh, which is another leading cause of death in young Americans today. This is in part because the coverage of minimally effective treatments is still abysmally low. 
These data show that more than 95% of people in low and middle income countries do not receive minimally effective treatment uh, for these leading mental health conditions. But astonishingly, this is also the case for rich countries where more than half of people don't receive minimally effective treatment. And this suggests to me that it isn't just about the amount of money you spend, but how you spend it that is extremely important. And I'd like you to think back about that slide that says redefining mental health care. This is tragically what mental health care continues to look like, particularly for people with serious mental illnesses and disabilities. These are mental hospitals, by the way, uh, in, in many instances in low and middle income countries. In richer countries, you don't see these such harrowing images anymore because, of course, what we've done, at least in the U.S., is replace these prison-like centers or hospitals with actual prisons. Um, and so we now lock up people uh, with mental illness in these, these sorts of situations. It's really quite incredible. And again, I, I, I often ask my, this is of course an echo chamber, all of you are very passionate about mental health, but if I'm sitting in a group uh, which is really coming from outside the field, I ask, imagine if this had been people with AIDS or breast cancer, um, and exactly how would you respond uh, with that, with your heart and your mind? In part, this is because we have systematically underspent on mental health care. Uh, in the, this, this is showing you uh, the, the burden of mental health problems across different countries of the world. And this is the amount we spend uh, as a fraction of the budget of health care on health on mental health. And as you can see, no country spends proportionately according to its burden. And indeed, no country, the rich countries donate to the poorest countries in the world uh, for mental health. On this slide, you can see that virtually all dollars that Canada, the US, and so many other countries give uh, towards development assistance to the poorest countries for health sector reform are actually missing mental health altogether. This is very troubling because actually, when you think about it, it tells you the limits of science. It tells you the limits of our ability to use science towards action. Three years ago, Richard Horton invited me um, to lead a commission for The Lancet to really investigate what, what do we really need to do to actually push the needle further? Well, not just further, to push it dramatically. And I think um, over three years, we got together, 28 colleagues and I, uh, and, and really in, in interrogated, was our approach incorrect? Was our approach incorrect to reduce suffering? And our approach up until then had been simply to focus on the treatment gap. That is to say, to improve access to clinical interventions. And we realized that while this was an unfinished business by a long shot, we really did need to think about other kinds of gaps if we were going to be able to achieve our goals. And the gaps we identified were first about quality. Because clinical treatments had been reinterpreted by many, many players as being treatments for specific diagnoses in specific hospital settings. And we realized that the entire message of building the base of the mental health care system to, through empowering frontline workers to deliver psychosocial interventions was simply being ignored by most people. We also realized that what really excited global health policymakers was the idea of prevention. And because we had been thinking of prevention in very narrow ways, influenced by infectious diseases, that there would be a vaccine or a bed net for mental health problems, we had forgotten that we actually did have very clear targets. And that was to do with environments in the early years of life. Yes, this is complex. And we recognize we must embrace complexity if we are going to address mental health problems. By trying to reduce the work we do to vaccines and bed nets, we were actually missing the reality of the complex nature of mental health. That didn't mean, though, that we couldn't do something about it. And finally, we also had to engage communities actively in trying to address mental health problems. I want to end by telling you about where I'm going with trying to establish this agenda. Two and a half years ago, I joined Harvard Medical School. Uh, and a year ago, with support from across the school's many faculties, uh, we have launched uh, Global Mental, Mental Health at Harvard. And of course, while science is a very important part of our agenda, uh, a very important part is actually creating the tools and products that enable policymakers and practitioners to implement the science we already have. And we identified five barriers, and we have work packages that seek to address each of those. The first is the barrier on scaling up community delivery of psychological therapies. And we are addressing this by building a digital platform that can train frontline providers not only how to learn, but also how to master and deliver psychological treatments. 
Champions is a program that intends to build the top end of the healthcare system by building capacity and supporting leaders in mental health care delivery to actually use the dollars they have in an evidence-based way. The next step, of course, is to make these dollars accountable. And one of the problems in our field is having metrics for evaluating the performance of mental health care system that can be standardized in a way that you can compare one province with the other, not only at one point in time, but over time. Um, and that is, of course, the Great Global Health uh, a Program of Countdown being extended uh, specifically to metrics for mental health. The fourth piece is to focus on prevention, particularly through environmental interventions in the first two decades of life. And finally, to engage people with the lived experience of mental health problems through all our work, particularly, this is an aspiration that I have really wanted to champion in the next phase of my work, is ultimately to eliminate coercion in all forms uh, in the care of people with mental health problems. At the end, the moral imperative really for us going forward is that people have the right for their mental health to be protected, particularly young people and people who we know have faced harms to their mental health, such as refugees. And when you are affected by a mental health problem, we have the right to quality care of our choice. And I want to emphasize choice. It cannot be care that is forced on you. And the right to life with dignity and respect. We do not question these rights for people with breast cancer and AIDS, and we must not question these rights for people with mental illness. I want to end by saying that none of this science could have been possible without the support uh, of my many hundreds of collaborators, too many to name, but also the funders who have stood by me. And the most important funder really is the Wellcome Trust that took a risk with me way back then when I was very young. Um, at a time when no one would touch the subject, when no one would consider mental illness important, particularly in the low resource world. And for me now that I serve on the panel that selects awardees for the Wellcome Trust, the one thing I have learned is if we, especially those of us who are research funders or working uh, uh, on panels, if we don't take risks and we don't take risks with younger people, we will never get our field to go forward. Because if someone is gonna take a risk, it's when you're young. When you're my age, you know, we're pretty much going to you know, plot on with what we've already done. And, and, and certainly the Wellcome Trust took a risk with me, and I believe that if I'm standing here today winning this prize, it's because of that. The MacArthur Foundation was another very important uh, donor that took a risk of actually working with young people in India on areas with mental health, and they've supported Sangat now for nearly two and a half decades. And of course, I also acknowledge many of the other funders without whom the rest of my body of work would not have been possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Patel. I think it's clear to all of us why the uh, committee at the Gerdner Foundation chose both the speaker, the researcher, and the topic as the winner for this year. Thank you so much for your fabulous, interesting, and important talk. Um, we're fortunate now in that uh, over the next couple of hours, we have actually four speakers, or actually more than four speakers, four lectures that we're all going to uh, have the opportunity to listen to. We have 25 minutes per lecturer, per lecture. And uh, if they finish on time, we'll have time for questions. And if they don't, there will be an opportunity for questions, hopefully during the panel discussion. So um, we'll have two speakers, then we'll have a coffee refreshment break and our final two speakers before our panel. So if I may call Dr. Carly Silver up to the podium. And Carly, I think is gonna introduce uh, Vandana Gopakumar on Zoom. So good luck. <laughs> Yes, yeah, a little technological things. Um, thank you, Vikram. It's uh, always inspirational to hear you speak. Am I just exiting this? Is that what I'm? There we go. So before we actually get, I'm just going to play this, which is um, from the Banyan, which is uh, Vandana's organization.
Sanjana, can you hear us? Yes, I'm Tali. Excellent. I'm so welcome for joining. Um, so where are we finding you today, Vandana? Thanks. First of all, Carly, I'm so happy that I could actually get around to doing this. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sitting in my home office now. It's about 7.40 in the evening. And congrats, uh, Vikram. I can't see him. But congratulations to you. We're all very happy and proud. Excellent. So we just watched the video of Andana of um, Home Again, which gives you a really brief glimpse into the kind of work that the Banyan is doing. Um, I had the, the joy of visiting um, some of the homes a few years ago. And the, the first one I walked into, I felt like it was a home full of my own aunties who were trying to feed me um, nonstop. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about uh, the Banyan? And, and um, you know, this is an organization that has just celebrated its 25th um, anniversary. Um, so it's a, been a bit of your life's work and would love to hear what set you on that path. Okay, so it's, it's actually been 26 years uh, Kali, yeah. <laughs> yeah, since you last visited. So, uh, what got us started? I really think it was chance, you know. I mean, I was just listening to Vikram's lecture, and it was so amazing to listen to how he had a very clear vision and he pursued it. It was quite the opposite, in uh, at least in my case. Uh, well, both Vaishnavi and I were uh, brought up in sheltered homes, and I think the one thing that we were learned. We would we were sort of inspired to do right from the beginning was to respond to any form of distress or to respond to anybody in need, and we were very driven by the principle of justice. So I think uh, it was um, it was uh, uh, a sort of interaction with a homeless woman with a mental health issue, and uh, I was doing my second year in psychiatric social work, uh, and as I got off the bus, I saw this woman there almost in the nude and running from one end of the road to the other. Uh, there were a whole lot of people standing there, but I think they weren't really in a position to respond because they didn't know where exactly one could seek help for her. Uh, so along with the help from the principal, me and my partner Vaishnavi, uh, we tried to uh, admit her into the Institute of Mental Health, which is, which is a straight run facility. And we learned that uh, there really was no option for care in. Uh, that facility. And then we turned to other civil society organizations. And while there weren't many, there was one that responded to her needs. But unfortunately, uh, it was, um, uh, it sort of catered to a whole lot of people and so specialized attention wasn't possible. As a result of which, when we went back to visit her, she wasn't really there. Now, Vikram mentioned towards the end of his uh, speech that youth really helps in getting things started. So I think it's a combination of uh, 
just being driven by the principle of justice, our parenting, chance, uh, the need to engage with a complex problem and not just sort of invisibilize people further and allow for things to pass by. And I think youth that uh, sort of uh, spurred us with that entrepreneurial energy. So it was a combination of all of that, really. That's excellent. And so that woman ended up being one of the first people who lived with you and your partner. No, unfortunately not. So she was admitted into this other organization. And so when we went to visit her, she'd uh, sort of left. So we'd lost mm. her. And that upset her, us terribly. And after that, all that we could see in this uh, two wheeler that my father had bought me was another woman with another homeless woman with a mental health issue and the third and the fourth and then we got to visit the institute of mental health much more often and like some of the visuals that wish uh, that vikram screened we were horrified because we uh, you know i did my field work in, in in an institute of mental health as well to see the way in which people were treated to see the lack of equity uh, to see the way in which social roles were compromised as a result of social disadvantage. So it wasn't just the mental disorder, it wasn't just the place of healing, but it was, it was also very much the background that I think uh, that had a role to play in the way in which people pursued, had, had opportunities to pursue their capabilities. And in this case, it was close to, uh, close to nothing. So that affected us, being the sorts of people that we are, uh, you know, wanting to dream and sort of chase our dreams. That's great. So the, the Banyan started kind of as a place that you were living with people and then ended up more of an institution and then went to a leadership academy and then has added on this home again model and it continues to iterate. Um, and tell us about how this, these iterations come about. Why, why do you keep kind of changing what the Banyan has to offer? So, so uh, I don't think we really have changed our vision. When we started, we were very clear that our focus was going to be to work with people poor and homeless affected with mental health issues. We've stuck by that. Uh, in the beginning, we thought that those who were homeless and poor really wouldn't have the capability to return home because one, uh, we would have reached them far too late. And so their recovery trajectory perhaps wouldn't have been as you know, positive as we, it turned out to be. And two, because uh, we felt that families had abandoned such persons with mental health issues. Now, remember, this was way back in 1993, when there were only 93 district mental health, uh, uh, district mental health programs uh, in a country that had over 500 districts at that point. We're now at 700 districts and we have 500 covered with the district mental health program. But the treatment gap at that point was really high. It continues to be high. It's between 65 to 85 is what uh, statistics say. But uh, we were proved wrong. So I think our teachers really in sort of the evolution of the Banyan have been, well, three significant uh, players. One is the people whom we serviced, that's homeless people with mental health issues themselves, who came to us and post the recovery stage said that, look, hey, we want to go back home because prior to getting to this center, we were accessing care uh, in faith healing centers or my family was too uh, poor to afford the next meal and they really wanted to focus on earning enough to take care of the others who were well. And we do know that even today, more than 70% of our country lives in $2 or lesser. So the bi-directionality between social disadvantage and abject poverty and mental Ill health was evident even then. Now our success really emerged or the model evolved when we went back and when these homeless people came to us and we realized that when we went back into these rural areas, most of them, while we are, we are, while we are located in Chennai, most of the people who live in our centers or who lived in our centers or continue to live for brief periods of time in our centers are from different parts of the country. Um, about 30 to 40% are from Tamil Nadu, the rest of them from the southern states. There's at least a 30 to 40% from the northern states. So it's Pan India, really, in a sense. Now, these people, unfortunately, as a result of lack of access to care, had wandered away. There was high caregiver strain because the families didn't have sufficient amount of food, poor housing, social disadvantage, a great extent of prejudice, not because people are bad and not because the stigma is high, but because I think 
as individuals, many of us are prejudiced to people who aren't really like, like us as a result of lack of social mixing. It could be as a result of, it could be gender-based structural barriers. I mean, race-based discrimination, gender-based discrimination, class-based discrimination, caste-based discrimination in our country. So once we realize that this combination of caregiver strain and abject poverty and lack of access to care, we'd, we realized that there was a need for continued care and therefore we integrated care systems for those who went back into our fam their families with local health systems. And there are amazing stories of, you know, women who returned on the same day that one of the women, I, I remember mentioning this to you, she got back home on the same day that her daughter was getting married after being missing for six days. Another daughter of a woman who had, who, you know, who, sort of received critical time interventions from us, is now working with us as a researcher. But she was together with her mother as a five-year-old on the streets, uh, with facing a lot of atrocities on the streets. And we know that, um, you know, Ellen Sachs talks about this in her book, where she talks about voluntary and involuntary care. And she talks about how homeless people in the US as well wear layers of clothing, because you just want to make sure that you survive. And similarly, as part of our, our ethnographic research, we've seen many people in the nights, for example, climb up trees and try to find shelter in trees, or just cover themselves with suit, so they're not sort of raped by the next person who just passes by. So I once we realized the social determinants of ill health, we decided that there was a need to work with health systems in each of these areas and thus evolved the whole notion of our 17 mental health uh, service units that currently service um, uh, um, 1 million. Uh, and that's again, thanks to grand challenges through the model NALAM, which means well-being with a focus where we sort of flipped the whole concept around and said that we don't go looking for people who are unwell, but here's this place that promotes the idea of everyone having equal access to pursue capabilities as Mark Anusiam put it. And so if you would like to do this, come to us and let it be a collaborative effort between the community mobilizer, who's typically a person from the community, like Vikram said, and this we started 23, 25 years ago with our very first model, or it could be our case manager, or it could be a member of the local self-governance structure, that's a panchayat member, but it's collaborative care. And when that happens, people get together to solve problems because each one wants to better their lives, really. And that primarily today focuses on facilitating livelihoods, because I think once social roles change, people begin to look at people differently. And there is a need for us to do that. When you think mental health or you think mental disorders, you think depression, anxiety, or loneliness, you think a certain kind of person, there is a prototype. And we stereotypify. And so you go back to Irvin Goffman and the spoiled identity. I think we need to break, get past those shackles. And that is what we're trying to do through Nala. Now, the last part of our model, so there's homeless people, mental health issues, and critical time interventions, but not really, as uh, Vikram mentioned, course of care, but trying to figure out how really hospitals should work. How can it be a place that provides a therapeutic environment where people heal? How can friendships be fostered? How can knowledge be co-produced? How can social audits that are driven by users of mental health services improve facilities in hospitals when hospital-based care is uh, required and how can that then inform the 43 state hospitals in this country or hospitals beyond this country and then Nalam so how can you change social roles how can you make it more collaborative how can resource cooling take place even from a financial model or a health systems point of view to make this more sustainable and then for those with severe mental disorders who aren't able really to go back to their families or those who have no families to go back to or those who choose not to go back to families uh, we arrived at uh, the whole notion, typically those with severe mental disorders, we arrived at the notion of inclusive living options because ideally you, you want to be part of an inclusive community. And that's where home get, again featured and the support from Grand Challenges truly helped us uh, uh, sort of develop the science behind what we intuitively knew would work. Because I mean, if you just provide an individual with a housing intervention and with personal attention. And by personal attention in a housing intervention that is non-clustered, I also mean access to local support networks, to neighbors, to socializing, to friends, to a temple or a church or a mosque, to work perhaps, to a pet, uh, and in many cases also to the idea of interacting even with 
the four walls and the idea of living in a house with formed families and three other people, right? So uh, when, when individuals transition from our hospital to these non-clustered homes in regular neighborhoods, gone was the blunted affect. And after a short while, we had neighbors with their children just dropping by with a child on the lap of a woman with severe disability. And then she looks at her, this woman, this child, and she begins le relearning uh, sort of motions of life that she'd sort of lost. So I think it is scarcity of not just resources, but scarcity of experiences that sort of uh, arrests the opportunity for people to grow, to feel included, and to participate. And if the UNCRPD is talking about participation and agency, it begins here by promoting social mixing, really. That's great. Thank you, Vandana. So we've only got a few more minutes left, but I would love to um, ask you to reflect a little bit on, um, Vikram mentioned his reality check of, you know, you've, you've developed all these approaches. Um, there are a million people being served by the Banyan at the moment, and yet um, I know you still wake up in the morning and think we are far from figuring this out. Tell us a little bit about kind of what is still the most challenging elements that you're facing and and also where you think the vision for um, mental health could be in India and around the world. Okay, <clears throat> well. In a few minutes. A <laughs> in a few minutes, that's a tough one. But very quickly, I think there are five essential points that come to my mind now. Um, one is, I think there is a huge, huge implementation challenge. There is a lot of science. There are a lot of models. There are lots of, there are several, several RCTs and Vikram has done such good work in that space. But unfortunately, when it comes to players, whether in the public or the private sector, there are very few who really want to engage with complex problems, deal with the intractability of such issues and stay with it longitudinally over a, problem, over a period of time and re-engage and co sort of co-create fresh and new knowledge and delve deeper. That's really, you know, the, the sort of transdisciplinary approach that we take. So I would say one is more stakeholders and combat the implementation challenge. It's good to have science, but science has to translate and over a period of time, especially when it's complex problems. Two, human service professionals. Yes, there is a need for the non-tech workforce. Yes, there's a need for psychiatrists, but unfortunately, human service professionals such as the social workers or social entrepreneurs who make great leaders, I feel that their value is somewhat discounted. If you have to bring about a change, there is a need uh, for the translation of the real world, embracing the messiness of the real world to be demonstrated. And that's what we did, right? We, so we demonstrated models and now we've taken it to scale with different governments and different foundations and different civil society organizations adopting it like the government of Kerala or the government of Tamil Nadu or the government of Maharashtra. So we'd expect other social entrepreneurs and other human service professionals to do the same. Now towards this, and I'm, I'm just digressing for a minute to answer the second part of your question. We have, uh, you know, sort of created the Banning Academy of Leadership in Mental Health. And uh, over there, in collaboration with the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, we train human service professionals. So we're hoping that we close the loop by providing these demonstra demonstrable models, building evidence, advocating and uh, sort of um, enthusing state governments and other civil society organizations to take them to scale, but we'd also then develop a passion school, a cadre of human service professionals, including community mobilizers, who should ideally be in a position then to close the loop and take this to scale. But finally, I'd conclude with the last two points, that is social roles. I think workforce participation is extremely, extremely critical. So as much as we focus on models, we have to promote workforce participation. And while there are reservations, it isn't really happening in practice. Not, very, not, any, not in all parts of the world. It's not just in the low and middle income countries. So I think that's something that we should focus on. And finally, social mixing. I think there is a huge need for us to realize that the only way in which stigma or prejudice or discrimination is going to change is if I'm going to be in contact with another person with a mental health issue and I know 
that that person is no different from me, or rather the person is different from me, and each of us has our capabilities, and each of us has our challenges, and we learn from each other. And only by that kind of learning, I feel, can we inspire for us to come together and build a socially uh, aware, responsible, and cohesive society. Thank you, Vandana. I'm, we're going to leave it there because of time, but I really appreciate all the work that you do and um, taking the time this evening to come in and zoom into this uh, audience and, and share your story. Thank you. I have, I have just one quick point, Charlie. Just one quick point, which is from a policy point of view, since along with Vikram, I was also one of the few people, uh, one of the 10 members of the mental health policy group. I think the one thing that the policy promised when we worked on it was convergence between the social and health sectors. Because I think the social determinants of health and the fact 70% lives on $2 or lesser has to be addressed. So if we had to change as a country, our health systems, resource allocation towards that, and the fact that it has to be convergence between health and social sectors, that has to turn into a reality. If not, it's gonna be status quo. So it's, it's not a hopeless note that I'm ending on, but it's a lot of work that I think needs to go into bringing various stakeholders together to make this possible. So thanks, Kali, for all your support, and thank you, everybody, and congrats again, Vikram. Thank you, Vandana. I think that that um, last session proves that one can have a low carbon footprint with Zoom and uh, not only give an interesting, important talk on uh, global mental health, but save a lot of carbon at the same time. The next speaker is uh, Vicky Stergiopoulos. Vicky and I met for the first time before and Vicky apologized to me saying that her talk was about Toronto and maybe that's not global, global health. And I would make the point that if you look at the SDGs, which of course, have to do with every country in the world, including Canada. Global health includes Canada. It includes anywhere where you have uh, social issues and um, people needing mental health. So the floor is yours. Thank you. It's uh, both a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here this morning and presenting on ways to improve housing and health outcomes for people that experience uh, homelessness and, and mental illness. Um, so I'll be focusing on the local, uh, recognizing that the issues are very similar when it comes to uh, uh, settings that are highly resourced, um, but we speak about disadvantaged populations. So homelessness is a rising concern in many countries, including Canada, where we have between 200 and 300,000 uh, homeless people, absolutely homeless people each year. Toronto is home to the largest cohort of them, with over 5,000 homeless people each night and over 27,000 homeless people each year, many of them youth, children and youth. I won't spend much time talking about the health of people that are homeless. Just to highlight uh, that they have high rates of uh, poor mental and physical health and premature mortality. And when we look at those that have chronic homelessness, this rate, the rates of mental illness and addictions are staggering. In a study done um, in Toronto uh, about 20 years ago by Paula Gehring, who was my mentor, uh, she found that about two thirds of people that were chronically homeless in Toronto had a lifetime prevalence of mental illness and another two thirds had a lifetime prevalence of, of a substance use disorder. What is less recognized, and we were able to shine light on it, is the degree of neurocognitive impairment in this population. Um, problems with memory, uh, verbal uh, learning and recall, um, information processing and executive function, um, domains that are instrumental in day-to-day -day functioning. And we were able to demonstrate in a Canadian sample that up to three quarters had at least mild neurocognitive impairment and uh, when we look deeper at the Toronto, uh, at our Toronto sample, approximately 16% had borderline or lower intellectual functioning, suggesting intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that those with low intellectual functioning had a lifetime duration of homelessness that was twice, a, twice as long as the rest of the cohort. So where, how are we failing those that are most vulnerable? 
uh, among us. When we look at uh, how we provide housing and supports to uh, people that are homeless and have a mental illness, traditional models have uh, followed more of a staircase approach where individuals uh, are homeless, go to the shelter. Um, if they follow the rules and agree to take medications and agree to see their doctor um, and start, stop using substances, they may have a chance to get transitional housing. And if they succeed there after a number of years, they have a chance of getting a permanent housing. And this has not served very well the vast majority of people. And Housing First uh, was conceived uh, more than 20 years ago now um, by a fellow Greek Canadian, uh, Samson Berries, who works in New York, um, and, uh, where housing is considered a human right and people are offered uh, housing of their choice with help from rent supplements, along with supports from uh, high quality mental health services in the form of either a third community treatment or, or intensive case management. And the Canadian government was brave enough to invest 10 years ago to the largest demonstration project on homelessness and mental health in the world to establish the effectiveness of the model of the housing first model in different settings in, with, within Canada, both urban and rural, and a variety of subpopulations, including indigenous, um, ethno-racial and racialized minorities, and people that were heavy users of substances. And the study um, that started 10 years ago, um, very, at a high, very high level, recruited adults, but about one in five were youth, um, and uh, people that did have a mental illness uh, and with or without a substance use disorder. And they were stratified, so they were separated to those that had moderate needs for support and high needs for support and randomized to receive the intervention or use well services what was available in their respective communities. And who participants were, they were recruited from shelters or the streets primarily, they were all experiencing extreme poverty. The majority were high school dropouts. Early childhood trauma or rates were staggering, as were the degree of comorbidities, a variety of comorbidities, uh, both uh, mental uh, health and physical health. And uh, just to highlight for the moderate needs participants to give you a snapshot of who they were, um, indigenous people were well represented as were racialized minorities um, and the lifetime duration of homelessness was over four years and this is what we found two years later where in each and every city housing first outperformed usual services we were less successful demonstrating improvements in other aspects like recovery like quality of life either um, generic or disease specific. Uh, there were some modest improvements in disease specific quality of life for modern needs participants, but we did not see that in high needs participants. Uh, who were more likely to have psychotic disorders? Uh, um, more than half had a psychotic illness, um, but um, otherwise uh, very similar to those that with moderate needs. And again, we're housing first outperformed the usual services with an absolute um, difference of uh, over 40% in housing stability over two years. But again, no improvements in other recovery outcomes. So we were able to demonstrate that Housing First can end rapidly chronic homelessness in many diverse Canadian contexts for homeless people with mental illness. And uh, at our setting, again, universal health insurance, relatively resource-rich settings, we weren't able to see improvements in other domains. This may not be true in other settings where uh, other services in the usual um, context may not be sufficient. But for us, this uh, original study, this landmark study, led to additional question. So if housing is first, what come next? How can we uh, improve other outcomes other than housing? And is the housing effect, uh, the, the housing stability effect of the housing first model temporary or is it sustained? Can usual care services catch up 
and eventually uh, provide equally um, equal effects um, in, in housing stability. And then what do we need to do for especially vulnerable populations? For me, I was um, shocked to see the prevalence of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in, in, in our streets in Toronto. And clearly that was uh, something we need to think about. So now I'm going to speak, turn our attention to Toronto, where we were lucky enough to secure funding to continue um, studying the model over several years, uh, including up to seven years of follow-up, which was, uh, again, a phenomenal achievement uh, given the nature of this population of convincing um, people that are homeless and, and have uh, serious mental health challenges to participate in a study for, for that long. And we're grateful to, to our participants who stuck with us. Um, and what was else that was unique in Toronto is that we focused on people that were um, immigrant and racialized. Uh, so uh, as you will see in a moment, um, our composition, uh, the, our sample composition was unique. And we were also privileged because we had a way of, of working that was up to us to determine from the original trial, which was very collaborative with a range of, range of stakeholders in our, in our community, from the City of Toronto and the housing sector, from the community mental health sector, to people with lived experience, and we supported a caucus of people with lived experience that informed every aspect of our work since 2009. Um, they inform the, not only the research questions, uh, but also what additional measures we needed to collect and how we would actually deliver the services and the interventions and how we would adopt them in ways that would be recovery promoting. Um, and we were grateful to that group too, that partnered with us um, in research. So, as indicated, uh, the Toronto sample was unique uh, in that uh, nearly 60% were ethnoracial and racialized uh, minorities. More than um, nearly half were born outside of Canada. Many of them are refugees. Um, and again, uh, the main duration of homelessness was over five years. With about, it was about one in five that were under 24 years of age. And again, just to uh, highlight how we were able to follow them for nearly um, seven years um, between 2009 and 2017. <laughs> and this is what we found. These are recently published uh, findings where for modern needs participants, six years after study entry, Housing First still continues to outperform usual services. And if this is impressive for modern needs participants, I wanted to showcase that for high needs participants, the results were even more impressive. And not uh, that the effectiveness of Housing First was any different for high needs versus modern needs participants, but our usual services, and this is what I want to draw attention to, failed miserably participants that had high um, support needs for mental health services. <laughs> they never quite caught up. Um, where are we failing? These are people, for our Toronto sample, high needs participants 100% had either schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, or bipolar disorder with psychotic symptoms. Really, really sick people and we failed them. Um, community functioning, we didn't see any um, relative benefits at, in Housing First versus usual services um, in our total sample or uh, stratified by ethnoracial racial group. And the same for quality of life and the same one for um, disease specific quality of life and the same one for substance use. And in our work, we were thrilled to see that uh, Housing First had an enduring positive effect on housing stability for up to six years of, of follow-up. And the important, impressive effect on uh, individuals with high support needs. We were also troubled by the fact that we saw no relative improvements 
in other aspects, recognizing that within our setting in Toronto, in a system of universal health insurance and uh, rich resources, individuals in usual care may well have access uh, services um, that were of almost equal value to them. What was different perhaps in what they accessed in usual services was the lack of convergence as our previous speaker uh, highlighted between the social, between the housing and the support services as opposed to housing first, which uh, delivers them concurrently and in a coordinated way. Several years ago, after the uh, first two years of the study, um, 2003 or 2004, we were lucky enough to secure a grant, a philanthropic gift actually, um, to establish an incubator of innovation for, for homeless health in Toronto, uh, which is located at the St. Michael's Hospital, now Unity Health Toronto. And the first project that uh, we launched was a recovery college for homeless people uh, with mental illness. Again, uh, based on what we saw in the At Home CISWA study. The, um, I, we engaged the uh, participants in the At Home CISWA study to co-create the college with us. What would it take uh, for them uh, to uh, embrace, um, to experience uh, better recovery outcomes. We looked at uh, models uh, of recovery colleges in uh, south of the border in, in Boston. We also looked in the UK where there has been a prol proliferation of recovery colleges thanks to the work of uh, Mike Slade over the last 10 years. And we looked at the very same principles and developed a recovery college that had high fidelity, that has high fidelity uh, to the uh, model that uh, has been, um, I guess, published recently in the Canadian uh, Journal of Psychiatry by Mike Slade and his group. Um, so that was Canada's first recovery college dedicated to this population. And we worked again with people with lived experience to develop the evaluation. They did not want to randomize. They told us we want choice. Choice is important and no longer do not randomize us. And so we work with them to design a quasi-experiment to identify if it works and how and for whom, and look at the outcomes that they thought important to them, including empowerment and quality of life and, and recovery and, and the quality of the, the environment, uh, the, the recovery supporting care. And I won't publish detailed results of that. This is in progress. This is yet to be published. I will share at a very high level what we are seeing. And unfortunately, when it comes to empowerment, when it comes to recovery or quality of life, we could not continue at the group level to not see improvements in this population. And when I spoke to colleagues in, in Boston and, and Nottingham, um, they highlighted that they see similar things. And then I turned my attention to what are they actually receiving and are they receiving a high enough dose of the intervention to, for us to expect better outcomes? And they weren't. The median number of hours of participation was 12 or less. So at the group level, it would be hard to see observable differences between um, the recovery education center and, and usual care. Um, we are continuing to do the analysis to identify um, different, different outcomes for groups that participated uh, differently. But it does speak to the need for us to not only look at uh, accessibility of services, but also acceptability of services and services that can engage vulnerable populations. And we're not yet good at that despite the fact that this service was co-designed with them. But we also had an opportunity to delve deeper and identify what is it in the environment that can promote positive outcomes according, uh, outcomes that are important to them, whether they're at the personal level, the interpersonal or the social level. And we heard about the importance of enabling environments, the importance of supportive relationships, of role modeling of mutuality, we heard about the importance of a non-hierarchical approach, 
uh, recovery education centers, thankfully, um, are based on co-production on where professionals and people with lived experience uh, are all students and they're all learn and teach together. And they found that very powerful. They, it helped not only uh, through sharing power, and, uh, power address stigma, but also help them deconstruct self-stigma that in main, many ways stood in the way of them um, participating as full citizens. So this work continues as we try to unpack and understand what we heard and what are the key ingredients that need to go into interventions to engage this population that is traditionally very difficult to engage. And I wanted to highlight, as our previous speakers um, also identified, the need in addition to addressing knowledge gaps and practice gaps, the, the need to address advo advo advocacy gaps. And when it comes to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, it's the advo advocacy gaps that we need to focus on. We were successful in convincing the province to invest in a, a very small demonstration project to see um, if we would be successful in helping a small number of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities exit homelessness, people that were residing in our shelters in Toronto. And we develop a cross-sector partnership. As uh, our previous speaker also identified, they need to work across sectors bringing, for example, the developmental disability sector that works quite differently from the housing sector that works quite separately from the mental health sector, um, how to work together to support this group. And we were able to successfully house uh, uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities using housing first principles, not necessarily the exact model. Um, and we're now working across the province. I'm, I'm happy to be part of these efforts um, led by others to both streamline screening, identification of people with intellectual and de developmental disabilities in our homeless shelters and in our streets, but also connect them to timely services. I will end by highlighting the importance of seeing housing as health the importance of integrating housing in our mental health interventions. We cannot speak about mental health without people having access to adequate income support, adequate housing, adequate um, access to high quality, um, inclusive uh, services. But I also need to highlight the importance of working and sharing power, and power with people with lived experience so that our services are accountable and are um, accountable to and, and addressing the, the needs that they identify and that prioritize. And I think that's all I wanted to share for today. Again, the um, importance of continuing to address the knowledge gaps, the practice gaps and the advocacy gaps. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stereopoulos. Um, I'm sure, like me, you have lots of questions. So there will be an opportunity during the pan panel discussion to have questions for all of the speakers. But right now, it's time actually for our health break. There will be coffee, tea, and receptions on the second floor. The bottom of this auditorium is the second floor. The top is the third floor. So if you go up the top, if you go out the top, come down one floor. If you go up this door where it says exit, go to your left, and there will be tea and coffee. Um, to your left. Please be back at uh, 1120, where we will start with our next speaker. Thank you very much. If I could ask everyone to be seated, please. Our next speaker is uh, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Dr. Nadkarni will continue our discussion around community-based care. Welcome.
Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here today. It's not always that I get to be at an event where my mentor is getting yet another award. So uh, that's a pleasure, but it's uh, uh, doubly a pleasure because um, I'm getting an opportunity to talk about what I like to call as the orphan child of global mental health, that is addictions and alcohol use disorders. So what I'm going to do today is um, walk you through on a, gen a whistle stop tour of some of the work that we have done around alcohol use disorders and increasing access to care for alcohol use disorders in India. But before I do that, I want to kind of rewind back um, approximately nine years ago when I, when I applied for my first fellowship grant at the Wellcome Trust in the UK. And my proposal was to do a longitudinal study looking at the long-term outcomes of alcohol use disorders in Goa, the place I, where I work uh, in India. And everything was going well. I was feeling pretty positive about uh, the responses that I was get, uh, giving to the questions that I was getting from a pretty intimidating panel. Um, and then one of the panelists, interviewers uh, said to me, well, why should we give you this money? Indians don't drink. And right there, sitting there, my heart sank. Um, reason one was I could kind of actually see the pot of money receding away from me. <laughs> uh, and reason two was I was thinking, this is something that I will have to kind of counter at every point of my life, uh, a working life, if I plan to do research in alcohol use disorders. I couldn't at that point of time call that bluff, but uh, it's basically a, a, a ill-deserved reputation that India has of an abstinent culture because evidence suggests otherwise. I'm just going to present two pieces of evidence where there's lots of it, but this is one piece of evidence which basically shows that India is amongst so very few countries in the world which predominantly drink spirits, as you can see from these, this map. And the other one is looking at trends in alcohol consumption and how they have either gone up, come down, or stabilized across the world. And as you will see here, India is one of a very few countries where the alcohol consumption rates are going up. And this has happened over um, multiple reports that the WHO has come up with. I mean, the previous one, 2000, 2000 to 2005, showed a similar trend. This is 2006 to 2010, and there's no reason to believe why this would change over the coming years. So as I said, it's, it's basically a, a myth that India is an abstinent culture. I mean, uh, historic, historical narratives as well as modern contemporary evidence points otherwise. And it's not just about the fact that Indians drink, but the, the, the bigger problem is about how Indians drink. It's not just the fact that the prevalence of drinking in India is increasing. The, the problem is around how Indians choose to drink. And epidemiological evidence shows that the current trends of drinking amongst Indians is predominantly male drinking, predominantly drinking spirits, drinking with the aim of getting drunk within a short period of time, and high levels of drinking related disinhibition all of which then leads to high proportions of alcohol use disorders compared to the per capita alcohol that's consumed, which basically translates into the fact that there's relatively more abstinence in India as compared to the rest of the world, but amongst those people who do drink, there are high rates of alcohol use disorders because of these patterns of drinking that I spoke about. That's just a problem statement. What can we do about it? And what we have seen in India is that policymakers in their infinite wisdom have decided to sort this problem out at the severe end of the spectrum of alcohol use disorders. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the problem is if you take a large number of people with alcohol use disorders, a larger proportion of those have what is called as hazardous or harmful drinking, which is a milder, relatively milder end of the spectrum as compared to alcohol dependence. And what policymakers in India have chosen to focus on is alcohol dependence. So they have put in a lot of money in starting de-addiction centers, which are basically housed within secondary uh, care or tertiary care institutions, which op for obvious reasons in India um, are poorly funded, 
don't have enough staff, predominantly provide medications when one of the main uh, interventions for alcohol use disorders need to be psychosocial interventions are geographically inaccessible. And even when they are available, they provide predominantly medications and no other interventions besides that. So besides these barriers, I mean, we know of several other barriers that operate in low and middle income countries like India, both on the supply side and the demand side. The demand side uh, issues being that alcohol use disorders or alcohol consumption seen as a moral issue. Uh, there's lack of awareness about alcohol use disorders. What are the kind of interventions available for alcohol use disorders? And also the supply side be, uh, barriers that I spoke about a while ago, all of which results in a barrier to access of care, which basically means that around, if, if around 100 people have alcohol use disorders in India, approximately around 14 of them get access to some kind of care for the alcohol use disorders. And I'm not talking here even about high quality care service. Okay, I'm just talking about some basic access to services for the alcohol use disorders. And amongst all mental, and the reason I call this an orphan child of global mental health is if you could see from these figures in India, amongst all mental health problems, the biggest treatment gap is for alcohol use disorders. So before I move into some of the work that we have done in, 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 in India, I just want to give you some context about the place within India where we do this work. It's a place called Goa. It's a small state uh, on the west coast of India. Uh, it's, a, it's a tourist uh, destination, which was uh, the, the, the Portuguese colony until 1961. So it's a huge European influence on our culture. There's a larger Catholic population in Goa as compared to the rest of India. So there's a cultural sanction to drinking. There are low excise duties on alcohol, so alcohol is cheaply available as compared to the rest of India. And there's a locally brewed alcohol uh, in, in Goa called the Feni. So, so I'll kind of leave you with this a little bit of trivia. Uh, the little fruit that you see, colorful fruit that you see on the slide there is called a cashew apple. It's not a native of India. It's a native of Brazil. It was brought to Goa by the Portuguese when they ruled us. Uh, what the Brazilians didn't know and what the Portuguese didn't know and what we go and are very good at doing is extracting alcohol from this fruit. It's a spirit. It's a very strong spirit. Uh, Goans love it. Uh, uh, many people who are not Goans don't like it because it's got a, a very strong odor. But when, go when they say that they don't like it, we just go and just say that's because you don't know how to drink it. <laughs> so. The questions before us well, after this problem statement is how do we bridge this uh, huge treatment gap that we have for alcohol use disorders? And the second big question is, uh, and again, this is based on our experience of doing this kind of work uh, in India is, is how, what is the portability of some of the evidence-based psychosocial interventions developed in Western cultures into a culture which is completely different from that? And these are the two questions that we tried to answer in a program called uh, Premium. In, in which we try to do th two things. One is to innovate the workforce or task sharing as we kind of spoken about. And the one, other one is how to culturally adapt this intervention. And innovating the, the workforce, I don't want to speak um, much about that. And Vikram has already kind of highlighted that, but there's a lot of evidence from the global health literature as well as global mental health literature across various countries uh, across the world, including in India, where non-specialist health workers can be used to provide first line mental health or psychosocial interventions for a range of mental health uh, problems. And, 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 and the second bit was how do we make evidence-based interventions developed in the West culturally more suitable, acceptable, and feasible to deliver uh, in, 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 a, in the setting that we are working in. So I'm not going to elaborate too much on, on the process that, processes that we followed to do this in the interest of time, but basically to tell you that it was a rigorous process followed over two years. Through these multiple steps, we managed to develop a culturally appropriate or contextually appropriate intervention for alcohol use disorders which or harmful drinking based on motivational interviewing and other cognitive behavioral inter, uh, strategies um, uh, through this process. And this was the outcome of that process, an intervention for, called Counseling for Alcohol Problems, or CAP, uh, a, a manualized intervention to be delivered by lay counselors in primary care settings for men with harmful drinking. 
So at the end of this process, we did have uh, 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 an, an intervention, but we didn't really know whether it's going to be effective or not. And the proof of the pudding then is in doing a randomized control trial, which we did in Goa, in which we randomized men with harmful drinking in primary care into an arm in which they received enhanced usual care, because usual care is generally in the settings that we work in is nothing. So we enhanced it by giving the mental health uh, care gap guidelines uh, to the primary care doctors in the settings that we are working in. And then the intervention arm was gap plus enhanced usual care. We started off with recruiting uh, our, our lay health workers to a very rigorous process of uh, interviews, um, uh, role plays, et cetera, followed by very rigorous training in general counseling skills over five days and counseling for alcohol uh, problems over the next five days, and then went through a very rigorous competency evaluation procedures before selecting our counselors who then went on to deliver the intervention in, in, in 10 uh, different primary health care centers. When we say lay counselors, I just want to elaborate the fact that these are people who did not have any previous training or qualifications in delivering any kind of mental health or health interventions. These were people who had demonstrated to have the required soft skills, so to say, to deliver a psychological intervention in the settings that we worked in. Once we had the counselors in position, we started screening for men with harmful drinking using the alcohol use disorders intervention, alcohol use disorders identification test in the primary care centers. And those who got randomized in the intervention arms got received the counseling for alcohol problems uh, intervention over up to four sessions, usually delivered over a week or a fortnight. And this is what we found at three months. Basically, the intervention or CAP was superior to enhanced usual care in leading to remission, which was defined as less, a score of less than eight on the audit, which means that they didn't have an alcohol use disorder, or more superior in leading to abstinence and also more number or proportion of abstinent days in the previous two weeks of the assessment. We also managed to see that this effects of these interventions were sustained over the next 12 months. And so the, the, the intervention was superior to the enhanced usual care in leading to remission, also in leading to abstinence and person days abstinence, and more importantly, for sustained improvement. Basically, people who were not having an alcohol use disorders at three months, as well as at 12 months. Something that's very important for something like alcohol use disorders because of the fluctuating nature of drinking problems. So lesson number one for us was that brief psychological treatments for harmful drinking delivered by non-specialist health workers in primary care were acceptable, feasible, and effective in reducing alcohol use disorders in primary care populations. What's interesting beyond that, and which I have not mentioned here, is that this same group of counselors also delivered an intervention for depression, um, which was based on behavioral activation, and again was seen to be effective. I say this is interesting because this is probably the first time where it was demonstrated that a group of non-specialist health workers could deliver two different kinds of psychosocial interventions based on two different theoretical schools for two different mental health or substance use problems. But the question that arose from this work that we did was, because we're focusing on harmful drinkers, what do we do about the more severe end of the spectrum? Because it does, it's not ethically right to be providing care in a primary care setting where you are saying, listen, we're going to provide care for harmful drinkers whom you might not even know have a problem and say that we are not going to do anything for the visibly unwell people with alcohol dependence. And from that arose uh, a second uh, proof of concept program, which was funded by Grand Challenges Canada called Conted, in which we tried to push the envelope a little bit more. Because until now, we had kind of developed interventions which were focusing on delivering only psychological or psychosocial interventions for people with drinking problems and other problems. Here, we tried to see if we could use lay health workers to do some of the things that traditionally doctors do when it comes to detoxification as the first part of treatment for alcohol dependence. So we had lay health workers doing some of the things that doctors would do. So for example, uh, measuring blood pressure, measuring pulse, uh, respiratory rate, checking, checking for ataxia, et cetera, uh, which uh, was done by these, again, lay counselors who did not have any background or training in 
um, mental health as well as, as medical uh, assessments before we did this training. We were able to show that we, this, this intervention was uh, acceptable, feasible to deliver, and more importantly, because we were kind of trying to get a little bit in the medical domain, safe to deliver even when uh, delivered by non-specialist health workers or lay counselors. So lesson number two for us was that some seemingly exclusively medical domains, which until now had not been handed over to non-specialist health workers, at least in this sphere of alcohol use disorders, were safe to be delivered uh, using this care of workers. What we also came across as we kind of started doing more of this work was that there was this large group of people or family members and people around those with drinking problems who had huge number of needs which were not met by the kind of work that we're doing, which was focusing on the drinker. And because there's a lot of interrelationships between the drinking problems and, and, and people around them, uh, it was very difficult sometimes to uh, not get them involved in the, in, 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 the, in the interventions that we were delivering. So we then thought, why not develop and test an intervention which is specifically for these family members, which has nothing to do with the drinker. This is devised and designed to meet the needs and requirements of the family members of people with drinking problems. And that led us to our next program called Supporting Addictions Affected Families Effectively or SAFE, again funded first by Grand Challenges Canada and then Welcome DBT in India. In this, we tried to culturally adapt an intervention which was developed in the UK called the five-step method, which is focused on meeting the requirements or the needs of family members of people with drinking problems. This was again delivered by non-specialist health workers or lay counselors. And it started off with an intervention development process and ended with a pilot randomized control uh, uh, trial to look at the feasibility of delivering this intervention. What we found was it was possible to deliver such an intervention to family members. And I say it's possible to deliver this intervention because the first thing was being able to identify such affected family members and then delivering an intervention to them independent of the, of the drinker was a big challenge. So we, we saw that we were able to deliver this intervention, but we also saw that there were quite a few things that we had not accounted for and which we need to kind of think about moving forward. So for example, in a closely neat and, 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 and family-based culture like India, it was very difficult to um, speak to as predominantly spouses of drinking men with uh, spouses of men with drinking problems to convince them that they had their own needs, emotional needs, cognitive needs, which were independent of the drinker. And so some of these uh, cultural barriers to acceptability of, of this intervention came up, and this is something that we are exploring in our future work. And the last uh, bit of, of work that we're currently working on is because we've kind of looked at the more severe and, and moderate end of the spectrum and not done much work uh, on the hazardous drinkers where we can actually focus on reducing risks of developing harmful or dependent drinking was providing care for these people who usually won't turn up at health services because by the very nature or definition of hazardous drinking, these are people at risk and have not yet developed any health problems. So we tried to use some basic technology to de deliver this intervention based on some evidence that is there uh, uh, in smoking cessation and, and, and other health related uh, problems such as obesity and, and, and basic text-based intervention for hazardous drinkers in three different settings, primary care, workplaces, and, and, and educational institutions. Uh, we have just about started the pilot randomized control of this, uh, of this uh, intervention. So watch this space, we don't have the results yet. <laughs> Where do we go from here? Uh, so we've kind of now uh, developed some interventions which have looked at harmful drinking, some at dependent drinkers, uh, developing an intervention for hazardous drinking, <laughs> Uh, and for family members of people with drinking problems. What I've increasingly realized that it's very difficult to have these kind of independent programs or independent interventions for what is a spectrum of disorders. And so we are thinking about how we can integrate these different interventions for the spectrum of alcohol use disorders and their family members to see if we can provide an integrated program which takes care of the needs of all these people. 
we are increasingly planning to get into prevention of substance use, alcohol use disorders, and other substance use disorders, especially working with young people um, at, 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 an, at an age where there's initiation of drinking, which in the case of India is around 13 to 14 years. We are thinking about how we can translate the evidence that we now have into a change on the ground. Uh, a lot of the, the randomized control trial evidence that we have does not necessarily translate into changes in policy. One of the things that's happening in India right now is an, a program called Ayushman Bharat program, which is universal health coverage for citizens of India. And we have been able to integrate some of the outputs of our work in the case of alcohol use disorders into the guidelines that have been developed uh, for this program. So hopefully in, in the near future, we'll be able to see the translation of some of this work that we have done into policy in India. So that uh, is in a nutshell, some of the work that we have done in the field of alcohol use uh, disorders. I guess if there are questions, I'll be able to take them up in the panel discussion that comes shortly after. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will go on from uh, India. I'd like to invite uh, Takesha White to the uh, podium, who will be talking. Takesha works at the uh, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The podium is yours. Thank you. All right. Yay! Yay. Oh, thanks for your persistence and patience. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Takesha White. I'm from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And I work in a division called the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness. I began this work with friendship benches and my mental health work in general at the community level when I was in the Division of Mental Hygiene, which is one of 13 divisions at the New York City Department of Health. So I chose this particular, and I'm so excited to be here today. In fact, um, this is my first time to Canada, so I'm also kind of like a tourist today. <laughs> so I'm a little geeky on that. And I'm excited to be here while we are honoring um, Vikram Patel, who I've learned a lot from his work over the years and my international social work experience. And also he was um, a keynote at our task sharing conference for Thrive NYC in New York City last year. And again, it was like, it's just awesome to see this work continuing um, to gain interest around the world. So this picture is critical for me because in the corner, you see a picture of the grandmother, a grandmother from um, Zimbabwe. So this is an image that comes from the Friendship Benches Zimbabwe. And every time I talk about Friendship Benches, I always mention Dr. Dixon Chibanda because he created this and formalized this in um, Zimbabwe, where there are one, like you mentioned, like one psychiatrist, 100,000 people or a million people. And um, the image on the bottom is what we were able to innovate around friendship benches for the New York City landscape, where folks are always around in the community and on this in, on in the streets. And this is an actual picture of folks at a um, inside of the middle of the streets on a very big street called Grand Concourse in the Bronx, where we set up friendship benches every year to promote interaction with folks and connectivity to resources for folks who would generally not even think about connecting to a mental health um, service. So today I'm gonna to pretty much go over what we're talking about when we're talking about closing treatment gaps, why we chose friendship benches, centering communities, um, particularly social determinants of health and how we specifically connect folks to resources, advancing equity and spreading the model, which is critical. Um, you heard Vandana talking about implementation strategy issues that we have around the world where we don't have as many doers, folks who are willing to practice or invest in the work. In the New York City Department of Health, we have three overarching indicators. So every project that we do has to somehow tie to these that we're trying to bring down. Um, infant mortality, premature mortality, self-reported health. In these indicators, there is a overarching um, and historical trend of specific, specific types of gaps. And these gaps are often between people, uh, between white people and black people or people of color. Um, also, um, it could be any, any black person from the African diaspora. So we, we could be talking about Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean, um, Afro-Latino, et cetera. 
And so, so when we're talking about these particular gaps, well, we also we get to narrow in on how how big is this how big is this gap? Like, what are we really talking about? So we can look at the gap for infant mortality. There's a disparity by race and, and ethnicity. For self-reported health, there is a disparity by race and ethnicity. So that's how folks talk about or experience their own health or their own experience of health within their bodies or within their neighborhoods and communities. Uh, for premature mortality, again, there is a disparity that is by race, but also persists by neighborhood. So I bring this slide in because we were able, as many of you has probably, have probably heard, your health can be determined many times by your zip code. So you can say, based on where somebody lives, how many years they're gonna live, right? And so when, you're, when we're thinking about mental health in New York City, and we have this massive organization called the Department of Health, and this gargantuan box of, I mean, bundle of funding <coughs> called for Thrive NYC, um, we find that if we're not specific and targeted, when you have a city with 8.7 million people, you're gonna end up giving the resources and the programming to the same folks who are over supported and actually saturated with resources. And then the folks who continue to live in dis, um, historically disadvantaged neighborhoods and communities will continue to reflect poor health outcomes. And so demonstrating these things, and when we know that mental health um, can, is a driver, um, as you were talking about, this disabling, Vikram was talking about whether we focus on what's disabling folks or what's actually killing folks when you know that folks, when there's a complete, where there's a loop between obesity and depression, there's a loop between you know, depression and diabetes. So you know that if we're just looking at, um, we're looking at and understanding this issue per neighborhood, by a neighborhood, it will be important for us to think about how to get closer to the ground to serve folks who don't have a strong infrastructure for mental, for mental health resources or other resources, and also have good reason not to trust anything that will come into the neighborhood <laughs> in the first place. So um, when we dive deeper and we specifically do what we have, we have Sparks data in New York City, but we also have data sets and we do community health profiles per neighborhood. We'll look at what, how a neighborhood is faring on a particular health outcome. For psychiatric hospitalizations, which show up in our community health profiles, you'll see that we still, we have the same kind of differences per neighborhood. So if you look closely, you'll see that the same areas are dark in that slide, they're darkened, and, the, the, and also darkened in this side. Not only are we having hyper focus of issues for psychiatric hospitalizations in particular neighborhoods, but then when folks get there, we're not even really effectively spending money <laughs> appropriately to treat people. So we're spending tons more money when there's a substance use diagnosis and, um, and mental health diagnosis involved. Um, when there's just a substance use diagnosis or no mental health or substance use diagnosis, we're finding that we are. Um, not effectively taking advantage of the, the funding that we're getting or that of the dollars that we're spending for mental health. So when Dr. Gary Belkin, who was the executive deputy commissioner of mental hygiene in the division of mental hygiene for the Department of Health, had an opportunity to think about how could we expand and explode mental health for New York City, he came up with working with community-based partners and community members, a, a six-principle approach to increasing mental health access for all New Yorkers. So Thrive NYC is a roadmap that was developed to create and increase and actually kind of redesign and transform the mental health system for New Yorkers in New York City. And it had six principles. Change the culture, which is essentially ending stigma and getting people talking about mental health, acting early, which is the first, as um, Dr. Patel brought forward, um, thinking about the first two decades of life and pre, uh, the prenatal stage for women. Uh, so thinking about um, you know, depression um, for mothers. Closing treatment gaps, which is where we focus for the friendship benches, partnering with communities, which is also a, a tenant for friendship benches, but working closely with community members using data specifically to, first of all, our data system was a mess in the city, um, but actually using data to get more closely to the problems and seeing how we can um, understand what's happening and then respond in a relevant creative way. And then positioning the government to lead. So having an office of Thrive or having a tenant that requires the city government to always focus on mental health. 
or have to close by executive order <laughs> the office, which would of course get a lot of press and create a lot of stress for any political figure. So setting it up where you kind of embed mental health in the way the government is working um, is a critical component of Thrive. So what we were learning in time when we were getting down to the, bo to the bottom of like, here we have this big $850 million investment in mental health in New York City, and we are finding that we're still not reaching um, people who need the support. Uh, we're not, there's a, there's a gap in the neighborhoods, and which means there's a gap in the populations because neighborhoods are often segregated of folks who are receiving this care. And then when they do get the care, they're not getting the appropriate care because of bias. So what we're finding is that racism, um, di um, discrimination, and bias was creating a lot of folks not getting treated properly, not getting diagnosed appropriately, and then, also, and then therefore not getting better. So there you have another reason why folks are not gonna trust the system. So you have folks who need the help, they're not gonna go get the help because they're like, I'm gonna walk in the door and you're going to you know, assume a certain case for me, and then that's going to have all kinds of ripple effects for my families, all kinds of ripple effects, which I was thinking about when, when Vikram was speaking, he brought up the case around folks being misdiagnosed, uh, the women who were being misdiagnosed um, around uh, having a sexual particular, maybe a STD, when there were actual you know, things going on in the home and personal problems happening and probably also social services, social factors that were creating tons of stress. I participated in a conference recently that talked about the pipeline between sexual assault and um, premature mortality in women. And you can see that there's an actual tie with, at, during the time of labor where women are triggered by certain experiences and then have complications in birth. So there's all these things that we're just not thinking about the, the whole person when we're going into certain health systems and certain health care facilities. And especially if you think about the history of, of looking only at the individual and then focusing on the genes and biology and not thinking about the social context with what they live in a space like the United States where we have such significant disparities and such that are directly connected to racism and structural racism. So we decided like Dr. Dr. Belkin comes to me and he's like, hey Keisha, you're the community person. You connect folks all the time. You create and innovate programs on the ground. Here's something I want you to see if you can figure this out and make it happen for New York City. And he handed me the pamphlet from Friendship Bench in Zimbabwe. And I was like, got it, I'm gonna do this. First of all, I worked in Zimbabwe, loved it. <laughs> Let's do this, you know, I think this is great. This is a great idea. Um, but there's a couple of problems. One, we have lots of benches in New York City and they're not like the most used <laughs> spaces and they're not attractive. They're definitely not more attractive than just standing in a coffee shop or like hanging out in a park. And so we had to come up with a way to make this more attractive, more stand, make something stand out. So I worked with, some architects who um, in, it called, in this program called the Interborough Partners to design a innovative kind of like huge bright orange Lego box um, <laughs> type of thing. So folks would be like living their New York trendy life and then think, whoa, what is that? Why are there Legos on the street and why are they life size? And um, have someone kind of be able to pop out and be like, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? How, how's everything going? Well, well, I'm great. What's this? <laughs> and like start the conversation about mental health and how, you know, everyone, one in five actually, you know, are diagnosed with a mental health issue. So we had, we can go on and around it. And so um, creating this interesting link, I reached out to Dr. Chibanda and he, you know, he and Ruth Berry over in Zimbabwe, over Skype, over Zoom, we talked about the program, how to bring it to the city. We talked about what's key around helping people change their minds around their own agency and their ability to participate in their own problem solving practice, which is oftentimes um, not something that is really lauded in New York City when it comes to these neighborhoods, when folks are being treated and, and hyper-policed, um, they're being um, underserved, <laughs> under-resourced, targeted, their children are targeted, their partners are targeted. They're not <coughs> seen as partners. They're not seen as co-creators. And so it's often hard to change that mindset and have folks believe in their own ability when, when their own efforts have been so undermined in a structural and systemic way for most of their lives. 
one thing that I was able to really spend time understanding was the modality that they trained in. So we learned about the problem solving system or train, training that they offer. Why grandmothers, so folks who are trusted, who just like um, Vikram said, are not planning on leaving no time soon in their neighborhoods, who care about the community members and have no judgment, which is critical. So I'm a social worker and I didn't want a bunch of like happy-go-lucky social workers coming in there like, oh wow, there's so much to study here. Whoa, can't wait to like help you out. And folks are like, nah, I'm good. So I wanted to like <laughs> create an ex experience for folks that they will feel more natural, you know? And I learned all of these, these techniques from what Vikram was telling me, these are the key tenets. And so we had to think about how to bring that forward out of our own New Yorkers, out of our own residents. And so we don't use grandmothers only, even though one of our key um, peers and peer supervisor is a grandmother of three, we um, have an intergenerational strategy. Um, the other thing to think about with Zimbabwe is that there's a huge piece about culture and supervision and like continuing to reinvest in your staff. So they go through ongoing trainings, they spend time with each other, they get economic st um, in, uh, stimulus type of activities, they can earn money in various ways, um, they can work on schedules that work for them. They're flexible. So we had to think about that for New York City. Some of the folks who work with us have services. They receive services because they're individuals with lived experience with mental illness. So I'm not trying to interrupt with nobody's checks with this little small check that I'm probably able to give them from funding from the Department of Health. So we will pay people based on their, their budget so that it doesn't interrupt with their earnings. So this is something to really keep in mind. You know, I'm a child who was in the welfare system growing up. And every time my mom would step into a space where she would have an opportunity to do work, we would lose our clothing allowance. And so she would be like, dang, I can't do this. Like she had four kids in our house. Here she is working at a detention center, cooking food for some kids. And that check like completely debunked her resources for clothing. And so now we're getting our clothing from trash bags from family members kind of pitching in. When, with that in my mind and my personal history, I'm like, I'm not trying to add, offer this small check to somebody if I can't offer them, if this isn't going to be a leg up for them, if this isn't going to result in them maybe being able to take a vacation or them being able to um, do something nice for their child, like even buy them a bicycle. And these are things that have actually been shared back with me. And that's from my personal history, understanding what it's like to live inside the system in the United States. So here's the, here's the screen. Um, so I want to show you guys a video so you can hear from these folks that I'm talking about. Ventures is a new innovative program based on organic communication and just asking people how they are and meaning it when you ask them how they're doing. Friendship Ventures should be all over the world. <laughs> it's so huge that they are sitting at these benches in the heat for the chance that maybe somebody will walk by that would need some help. They'll be able to sit there and connect them to care. We've had some amazing peers on our team, you know, Steven Lopez, who lives his recovery daily, has in fact walked over 10 people to medical detox just from giving his story and being committed to the change that he can be in the community. I could see a mirror. I could see myself on the other side. I can see what, they, what they're going through, I went through. Skip has lived a very complex and challenging life and now she's this hero to so many. She leads our peer work as the peer supervisor. Every conversation makes a difference because people are heard. It's like, yeah, you know, you know, you've been there, you can help. Those person to person, those peer to peer uh, relationships and feeling comfortable in one's surroundings really do make a difference. Friendship Pinches was designed and started in Zimbabwe by Dr. Dixon Chibanga. And in the last year alone, more than 30,000 people received treatment on the Friendship Bench in Zimbabwe. happening right now. We are launching friendship benches in more than uh, 200 health facilities. Wow, wow that's, that's amazing. A lot. <laughs>
Dr. Mary Bassett, who was the New York City Commissioner of Health, having worked in Zimbabwe for 17 years, was just like, how about we think about ways to bring this model to New York City so that the everyday New Yorker could engage with someone and get support around mental health. So we innovated. New York City is unique because it's so active that the streets are where people like to be. That's why friendship into the New York is so real. When you're walking down the street and you're stressed out and you're struggling with something, you're thinking about how you could get support and then out pops Skip. And she's like, hey, how you doing? our peers can sit there and call and connect a New Yorker to resources and get them an appointment. It's a magical moment that our peers wait for every single day. Every month, hundreds of people are saying thank you. This is the power of Friendship Benches. This is the power of that magical moment. And we get to be a part of it. So um, I wish like, Every time we get to I get a chance to share a video of Skip or Steven or and talk about their impact or their work in the in this uh, city, it is so humbling. It's particularly humbling because um, when I first interviewed them and I first sat across from them and they're telling me their stories about living under bridges or sitting on on top of hills, you know, um, using or losing their families being um, dependent on substances and dependent on systems and dependent on family members and feeling useless, feeling disempowered, um, feeling like there was no hope. When I see them as leaders and leadership positions and you know, they've recently been interviewed by Good Morning America, by Telemundo, by Univision, I, can get, I get so moved because I actually know that's real. <laughs> Their stories are real stories. They're real people. And it's just like we talked about when you change a lot, when you allow an investment in someone's triumph and hard work and perseverance, and it changes their social status, it changes the way people look at them. You know, Skip was able to purchase a vehicle. Um, you know, she leased it, but she, you know, she has a car, <laughs> you know, and um, Stephen was able to, for the first time, unenroll from stuff. Um, from health benefits from, from within the city. So he no longer gets um, any kind of benefits from the city. And he told me this with tears in his eyes after three years of working with Friendship Benches and being a full-time employee based on his triumph and skills and him de with his desire to give back. And so that's how we, the numbers of course have gone up. This was back in 2017 when we were doing this, um, putting this, this video together. But French Adventures has also scaled up. They've treated 80,000 people to date in Zimbabwe. They've moved on to Malawi, Kenya, and Zanzibar in the United States. And more and more folks are looking into it, but more and more folks are not funding the program. And so there's still a gap there where we need folks to not just like the idea and want to hear about these models, but actually invest in creating safe and innovative, no strings attached, I'm not asking for your social security, not asking for <laughs> your child's name, you don't have to give me your address, I don't even need your first and last, I just want to make sure you're okay. Really investing in strategies that make people feel, feel safe um, and comfortable. Of course, this model is informed by evidence and it comes from the cognitive behavioral therapy model or techniques and um, you know, treatment and care for mental health, which is very common, but it's broken down so that people really see themselves as part of um, their own solution. And uh, it takes up uh, some intensive training to uh, make the work effective, but it also continually providing supervision and care to the peers so that while they're in their recovery and being in their hearing stories that they can relate to and that maybe come up for them, they get a chance to have someone to talk to. They get a chance to sit in peer networks and have conversations that, um, support themselves continuing to be successful in their recovery. So they're professional heroes, they have lived experience, they have vital community knowledge. All this is critical because they're folks that we don't always think about putting in permanent positions. We don't always think about, we don't always see a person who is homeless and see their future as a peer supervisor. And I think it takes that kind of radical imagination to really change the landscape for folks. So these are our, this is our impact. These are some of our peers right now. The one thing about Friendship Benches is that we are really non-traditional. So we're everywhere. We're at events, we're at parks, we're at playgrounds, we're at, and we're also every day in the community on the corner and benches. Um, and so 
you don't see a conversation about mental health as something that's in a white walled space. You don't see it as a space that have, you have to fill out a bunch of forms. You see it as something that's woven into the built environment and fabric of your neighborhood. And the, com the most common conversations that folks talk about are depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation slash substance use. And they're very close. Those are our most common topics. But they talk about all these things at, con at um, Friendship Benches. And our peers, we have folks who have specialties. So we have recovery folks, folks who have lived and been homeless with a mental illness. So we have folks who, are in a who have specialties with LGBTQ communities. We have youth peers, et cetera. So really trying to make sure that we touch upon a broad spectrum with relevant providers. Um, so one of the things about Friendship Ventures is that we use a, now, a, a service called NowPal in order to directly connect folks to resources for social determinants of health, uh, associated to their social determinants of health. And we're thinking broader. So like you're stressed out, maybe also you feel depressed or you're anxious, but you also need housing or you need food or you need a clothing voucher. And so we use a now this screening tool that has thousands of resources in our neighborhoods to connect folks to these resources on the spot. We provide them with a referral and we connect them to the services. We keep in mind that it is the hunger, exclusion, violence, injustice, poverty, that is what's stressing people out the most and then creating a cycle that they can't, that they, they believe they can't get out of. And it's creating a series of thoughts that we um, that become looped into their minds and have them to believe that there's no hope. And that is that can be moving someone from having a common disorder to having severe depression. So we're really working on, we work with that in mind and make sure that we have these context, this context for the folks that are on the benches. Um, one of the reasons why we think about with social determinants of health from, is informed by some folks of mental health or informed by some folks from Morehouse who also speak with, a, with the frame around racism and segregation. And I bring this up critically because structural racism disproportionately impacts black people, <laughs> obviously, but it also creates a system that is invisible. And so oftentimes you think that by, by treatment and care, someone should get better, but it's almost impossible for them to heal when as soon as they walk back out, they're targeted, marginalized, hyper police, or they're said to have a, a stress like a ADHD or something else that's happening in their classrooms. They're made invisible by their teachers. Um, they're targeted by police officers just walking to the park. And this is the spectrum from adults to, to, to uh, you know, elementary students. So our work acknowledges the ways racism and gender oppression considered um, conspire to create poor mental health outcomes. And that's why we will focus specifically on racism and prejudice and power and the fact that in the United States, race, like this is marks 400 years of slavery in the United States is this year. But um, we, we're only a very recent future that there, recent um, past that we've had any civil rights in the United States. And when you look at this arc, this is woven into the way our screening happens. <clears throat> this is woven into the way folks are treated at hospitals, treated at schools, how their housing is treated or maintained or not maintained, how their parks are maintained, their streets, whether their trash is picked up, whether they're considered trash. These are, this is something that is a part of our, of our nation's history and practice. And so we have to keep, keep a very close eye on that. I bring this slide up because this is from Chicago, but you'll see here that in 1992, in 1922, there was a severe concentration of schizophrenia rates in the darkest section there. Oh, am I too? Am I over? Two minutes, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I can't tell because of the delay. Sorry about that. Um, and if you look at the redlining map, you'll see that those were the areas that were redlined for no investment. So you have an area that has a history of a po of a population of folks that really need the help, but then you get a federal policy that comes forward that says, "Don't give anybody in that area a house to live in." <laughs> don't give anyone uh, a loan. Um, don't build businesses there. Break down the transit. That is compo that compounds the stress and the pain and the and the um, aggravated trauma and chronic trauma in those areas. So I was just showing how this segregation is con is consistent today, and we see the consistency with the neighborhoods, which is why we focus on French benches being in key neighborhoods in New York City. And I just go into this more. I'm sorry, I have to wrap it up. Um, but at the end of the day, I guess what I really want to bring forward is if you're thinking to bring forth these strategies or you want to, you know, pilot this work, 
also take in the history of race and racism in your neighbor in your um, towns and communities so that you focus on in the neighborhoods that need it the most but then don't go in there with like a white savior coat with a white savior mentality go into those neighborhoods and employ people who have triumphed in those neighborhoods who have survived and persevered under historic oppression and disinvestment. And then fund the work there, hire those people, make them leaders, allow them to inform the strategy, help stabilize their lives, and then help them work through what it means to move into different social stratas. And you'll see that they'll still have the outcomes with the populations you're seeking to serve, but then you'll also have a new workforce that is stimulated, mobilized, and, and um, able to move into other fields of healthcare delivery. Thank you. Is right, sort of rush you, and a great example of successful implementation. Congratulations. I'd like to call uh, Peter Zadmari to, uh, to the podium, who's going to arrange the panel. Peter is the Chief of Child and Youth Mental Health Collaborative between SickKids and the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. So Peter, put your panel together. All right, so may I ask the panelists to come up to the uh, table? And in the meantime, I'll just say what a delight it is to be here today and to hear about the amazing progress that uh, the area of global mental health uh, has managed to accomplish in the last uh, number of years. Much of that is uh, due to the work of Dr. Patel and his colleagues. And it's great to see uh, that the field, which has uh, changed so much since uh, I started my training, uh, delivers such promising, exciting, and innovative um, interventions. So we're going to hear from two other speakers and they're just going to talk for a very brief moment about the work that they're doing and then we'll uh, then we'll have an interaction between the panel uh, so that they can respond to each other in some way and then finally uh, we'll do questions uh, from the audience. So the first speaker is uh, Dr. Rennie Linkletter from CAMH, and I'll let her introduce her work. Thank you, Peter. Okay, go forward. Um, make sure my slides are moving. Okay. Um, I guess good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as Peter mentioned, I'm Rennie Linklater. I'm from Rainy River First Nations, which is um, in Northwestern Ontario, part of the traditional territory of uh, Treaty 3. And I direct um, Shkabe Makwa, which is formerly known as Aboriginal Engagement and Outreach. We rebranded uh, this past spring and um, have really come to define the work uh, that we do as a completely Indigenous team at KMH. And um, so we work across the hospital with uh, many of our colleagues and many different programs and initiatives. And uh, so that would um, include some of the clinical work that we do. Um, we also have an Aboriginal services clinical unit as well, as well as um, an Indigenous telemental health program. And so lots of types of um, in-hospital um, services, both inpatient, outpatient, and then uh, different types of services that are offered across the province. Um, we also work um, really, I guess, closely with a number of the KMH research centers and um, you know, some of the ways that um, our colleagues are able to draw on us is when there is um, an initiative or a research project that um, has a component that would be beneficial for First Nations and Inuit or Métis communities to be involved in. They may come to us um, to be able to help broker some of the relationships that we have with our communities, um, often for some advice around some of the research protocols and ethics. Um, there's a lot of I would say important issues that researchers, um, as you know, have become really mindful of in terms of doing um, and conducting research with Indigenous populations. And so um, up here on the screen is just some of our team um, and some of the colleagues that we work with in the different um, research centers at KMH. Oops. Sorry about that. I don't know if I'm, maybe I'll just use the, uh, that one, yeah. 
Please. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm just going to use that. I think. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and uh, and I'll also just note that there was an amount of work that we felt that we needed to do internally um, with our organization to be able to. Um, you know, work well with our colleagues and to make sure that our colleagues had some resources uh, that would help guide the work that they're doing. And um, so one of the things that we did, and this is available online, is we put together a bit of a guideline and resource manual um, for colleagues around conducting research with Indigenous um, peoples in Canada. And so this uh, kind of goes through the literature um, and compiles some guidelines about what some of the important steps are to think through as we're embarking on projects. Of course, um, the whole realm of language and terminology um, comes up almost daily for many people in terms of what are the appropriate um, terms to be using to refer to First Nations, Inuit, or Métis. So we put some um, guidelines around that. And uh, being a hospital, um, I'll also mention that we're tobacco free, of course. And um, however, you know, in terms of tobacco is one of our medicines um, for many First Nations. And, uh, and we use this um, in many ways, including um, when we're offering um, tobacco to research participants to become involved in our projects. And so we make sure that our policies at KMH really reflect um, the ways that we do our work as an organization. And one of the projects that uh, I wanted to highlight was um, a project that we have that works with five First Nation communities in kind of the Western um, part of Ontario. And this is a community-based participatory action research where um, we work with communities to really kind of identify the priorities and the needs that they have and then to help develop a mental wellness strategy um, and then move forward to implementing it and evaluating it. And there's many steps that, uh, you know, we kind of think through even before we embark on a project, you know, so one of the first things we might think about is how do we select a community. And uh, with this particular project, we had already been engaged um, with a previous research project with two communities. So um, this was an opportunity to kind of continue the work that we were doing with those two communities. And then we invited three more communities as well. And um, so as we're uh, thinking through those process, um, what we would then do is we would um, connect with the health staff and uh, the health director and some of the other um, mental health workers that might have some information or some knowledge or some experience about why uh, a project like this might be helpful or beneficial for their communities. And if they feel um, that it might be a good fit, then we write an invitation letter to chief and council. And uh, there's a lot of, and this, is, this becomes part Part of the important process um, around ethics and protocols is seeking appropriate community consent and so then after we um, issue the letter often we're then invited to come and do a presentation um, so myself um, and uh, Samantha Wells who's a director of our uh, mental health or Institute for Mental Health Policy Research is the principal investigator on this project and so um, her and myself would go out um, uh, with other team members and present as chief and council and talk about the project and get some um, you know, just kind of interest from them to see if this might be something that they're interested in implementing in their communities. And often what happens is that um, what kind of confirms their involvement is they pass an official band council resolution. And so this becomes something that is um, recorded on record. And this becomes important actually in terms of sustaining some projects because as we all know with elected leadership, sometimes that leadership changes. So we want to make sure that if we're continuing on a, um, you know, a multi-year project that uh, we have um, a mechanism within the community to be able to continue regardless of who the leadership is. And then once the community comes on board, um, we hire local community members um, and we really do our best to flow as much funds to the community as possible. So sometimes that means um, renting space within the communities um, for offices, obviously hiring um, communities and community members and helping to build their capacity. Um, we also create uh, community advisory um, committees as well or circles as well. And so on the advisory, that could include um, leaders, it could include elders, um, staff members, people with lived experience, and anyone really in the community that might have an interest um, in being part of these dialogues and helping to advise um, on some community processes. And, um, and then I guess the next step notes is that um, we then embark on a process to be able to develop um, a collaborative research agreement which would include a data sharing component and because of the issues around um, OCAP principles which are um, the ownership control access and possession 
um, this really sets forth um, a kind of a practice and a guideline for us to be able to work with communities to make sure that if we are using community data where possible, um, we are able to kind of um, utilize those principles. And, um, and sometimes it might not be fully possible to implement all of those principles. So for example, um, the possession piece, the community may or may not have a repository to be able to um, actually hold their own data. And so these are things that are then um, outlined in the data sharing agreement. Also within that research agreement, um, you know, we talk about publications um, and ownership and authorship and uh, intellectual property, of course, um, is something that we always want to make sure that we are able to have um, positive um, reciprocal relationships that really acknowledge the community knowledge, um, particularly around traditional knowledge as well. Um, we have a large knowledge exchange component within this. So um, some of these photos up um, on the screen are from one of our uh, community forums that we held last spring. And, uh, and then we um, are often invited back to chief and council to be able to present the findings as well. And, and I just want to say that at um, the presentation that um, we, we offered back at Saugeen First Nation for this specific project, when we talked about um, what the next steps were, what the community was identifying as priorities, um, the chief acknowledged the important work that this project had identified and committed um, local investments to be able to see through some of the initiatives that were identified. And I think that that's something that becomes really important is that we're working with communities um, in a way that uh, they see beneficial and that they can have tangible items to be able to move forward in terms of one of the, uh, some of the strategies that um, they might want to be able to implement within their communities. And then um, the last project I just wanted to mention is uh, our Northwestern Ontario Wellness um, Project. And some of you might know that um, in Kenora has been identified in Ontario to um, have one of the um, upcoming casinos. Um, there's a number of casinos that are being implemented across the province. And so a few years ago, uh, we had been meeting with Chief and Council and Kenora Public Health and some of the service providers in the area um, around this initiative. And it became really important to be able to do um, you know, some research and be able to put um, some mechanisms in place that we not only can focus on some prevention um, and some training initiatives, but really work with that, those communities around there to better understand um, how to mitigate some of the harms um, that, that, that we know are, are going to come about as a result of having a casino in that area. Um, as this is in Northwestern Ontario, there's a high um, percentage of First Nation communities um, and people throughout the territory, Métis people as well, less um, for Inuit people. And um, so one of the um, I guess areas that we have really moved forward on in terms of some of our research, and I would say systems tools as well, is the fact that we now have um, very specific demographic um, identifiers in um, our surveys that we include. And because of this, um, and so there's an example up on the screen about, um, and this is just part of the demographic identifier, it's not, it's not the whole page, um, but we do separate out now, um, you know, different ethnicities and specifically under um, indigenous populations, we would have First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. We do not put all of, um, you know, those um, populations together under an indigenous, um, you know, kind of category. And one of the reasons why is because we know that there are indigenous people around the world. And so sometimes that may um, become complicated and confusing for people that are actually identifying in a survey. So for myself example, um, if I see the word indigenous, I might check it off. And then later on, if I see a few sentences down First Nations, I might not check that because I've already checked um, you know, indigenous. And so there's a risk uh, and an element that we, there, there might be skewed data out there um, when this exists. But because we have this, these ethnic identifiers, what this means is that we have an ability to um, have a specific data set um, per population. And um, because of that, uh, right from the beginning of the uh, project a few years ago, um, we started meeting with uh, the First Nations um, organizations and political leaders um, within that territory. So that would be Grand Council Treaty 3 and Kenora Chiefs Advisory, as well as Métis Nation of Ontario. And, um, you know, not only to include them in the way that we were um, developing the project, we have a community advisory um, group that um, comes together that advises on everything from the survey um, development to implementation to looking at some of the research findings. 
And uh, so we're in the process now of um, negotiating those data sharing agreements with um, Grand Council 33 and our Chiefs Advisory as one agreement and with Métis Nation of Ontario as another agreement. And it's really important uh, for us that we respect the political leadership and the organizations that are in place to be able to manage um, this data because at this point they're the ones that um, would mostly have the authority over this. And um, we've just rolled up our survey data, uh, data. so we're starting to look um, at some of the results. And of the 819 surveys that were collected, um, and we had our mobile van that traveled um, throughout the region, so up as far as Red Lake, if you know what um, the kind of map of Ontario looks like, down through Kenora, down through Fort Francis, we had about 1,800 and 19 surveys completed and 20% um, of those respondents um, identified as either First Nations Indian or Métis. So we do have a very strong data set um, and they're very interested and eager um, to be able to get this um, specific set so that they can better inform the work that they're doing around responsible gambling um, and some of the treatment needs um, and training needs that they might have throughout the area. So that's a little bit about um, some of the work that my team is doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rennie. Uh, next is Dr. Daisy Singla from the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto and Mount Sinai Hospital. I might need some assistance here. Yeah, no worries. I'm having a bit of trouble. This is a lot more challenging than it looks, I promise. Um, so perhaps in the interest of time, um, I'm just going to introduce myself briefly. Um, as Peter had mentioned, my name is Daisy. I am a clinical psychologist by training. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto within the Department of Psychiatry, and I'm housed out of Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, I was mistaken as a medical resident earlier today. So as you can tell, I haven't been in this field for very long. And it's such a pleasure to share this stage with um, such esteemed colleagues um, and to celebrate Vikram's uh, success, um, one of many successes with regards to his prolific career. But I think the description that describes me best is that I'm a global mental health researcher. Um, though I am born and raised in Canada, my parents are from India, and I'm not going to go through an entire biography because I recognize that you probably have many questions for our esteemed uh, guests. Um, but my journey in global health really started 10 years ago, and that inspired um, basically this uh, recognition that many of the lessons learned in global health need to be brought um, to our local context here in North America. And uh, Takesha, uh, Takesha, you did an excellent job of highlighting that. Um, very briefly, um, for my PhD thesis, we implemented a parenting intervention, which also focused on maternal mental health. Um, it was, I think, among the first that integrated both uh, child development and um, a focus on improving maternal mental health, um, reducing depressive symptoms. We collaborated with a local NGO. We focused on both parents, um, mothers and fathers. And there was 12 group sessions in rural Uganda, 350 kilometers north of Kampala. Um, and if you're interested in this study or any of our work in Uganda, I'm happy to describe that in uh, more detail, but it's been published in the Lancet Global Health in 2015. Um, and that's what really catalyzed my interest in maternal mental health, as well as my experience in India. Uh, if you don't recognize this logo, um, that probably means you haven't been paying attention to the last four hours. Um, but effectively, I had the distinct pleasure of working with an NGO, which um, probably has been my best experience uh, of my life to work with Sangha, um, and also a life-saving life experience in many ways. Um, but Sangath is based out of Goa, another fact that you should know. Um, and it became very clear that lay counselors, whether in Uganda, whether in India, whether in Bangladesh, whether at, there's been many, many countries in Zimbabwe, that lay counselors could, can deliver manualized treatments. Um, there's a whole bunch of evidence to demonstrate that. But there were a lot of gaps um, that we, there were a lot of questions that we still had. And Bikram had highlighted this idea of assuring quality. So, Specialists were still being uh, required to supervise and assess the quality of these treatments, which is not exactly a scalable model. And we still didn't know why treatments were effective. And so, uh, oops. 
I seem to be missing a slide. Um, but in any case, it was very, very clear that we had brief, that there were brief evidence-based treatments that were effective, that could be delivered by lay counselors, um, among other non-specialist workers, that these treatments were delivered um, and the supervisor played more of a role, sorry, the experts played more of a role as, um, an ex as a supervisor or evaluating or assuring safety. Um, and these treatments were really were patient-centered in the sense that they were delivered where the participants were. Um, and so I thought to myself, and I thought a lot about this uh, in collaboration with Abby and uh, Vikram, how can we re re reverse engineer some of these concepts? How can we make our treatments as patient-centered as possible? And also recognize that this is a huge movement, movement that actually started in the US and the UK with regards to paraprofessionals. Um, and Canada is no exception, as we know. Uh, psychological treatments are recommended as a first line of treatment, but they remain inaccessible for the wide majority of populations. This includes perinatal populations. Um, so very, very briefly, um, we uh, were, after many months and uh, much deliberation, we decided to apply for, and we were very fortunate to win, a pragmatic clinical study award from an organization called PCORI. Uh, PCORI is a US-based organization, um, which stands for Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute. And I would say that they're very much a global health institute. So everything that I learned within global health, global mental health, um, are, are values that they um, aspire to. Um, and the goal of this project, which is now called Summit, or Scaling Up Maternal Mental Health Care by Increasing Access to Treatment, um, is to reverse engineer and adapt HAP for perinatal populations with depressive and anxiety symptoms. We're implementing this project as our trial is kicking off in January um, in Toronto, Chapel Hill, and Chicago. And if successful, when successful, um, it will be the largest psychological treatment trials, so largest psychological treatment trials for perinatal populations. Our goal is to examine the who, how, why, and how, sorry, who, who, how, why, uh, there seems to be missing a what, but in any case, uh, we are comparing non-specialists, which in this context are nurses, to specialists delivering brief behavioral activation. Um, we're also comparing telemedicine to in-person, and this is a non-inferiority trial. So we're looking at e equivalence in terms of the effect on depressive and anxiety symptoms among women in the perinatal phase. Um, based on my experiences in the global mental health realm and working within Bikram's trials, um, we are also exploring mediating pathways as well as assuring quality through a scalable model of peer-led supervision. Um, I'm really excited about this trial. Um, it involves 24 collaborators. It involves many, many stakeholders, uh, all the way from patient and patient advocates to in individuals who work and um, lead insurance companies. Um, and you can imagine in a place like North America, um, it involves many, many key stakeholders, including clinicians. Um, so, in short, I, I think the best way to introduce myself is I'm a global mental health researcher uh, who's had the distinct honor and pleasure um, of being mentored by this year's Gardner Global Health winner, Dr. Vikram Patel. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So, I do think we have some time for discussion amongst the panelists, um, and then we'll turn to the audience. So I invite a member of the panel to comment, make a reflection, ask a question of one of their co-panelists and get the discussion going. Who wants to volunteer? You're going to have to share the microphones because there's six of you and two microphones. So Vikram, why don't you start, please? Uh, <clears throat> So first of all, can I just say what a, what a pleasure it was to listen to these different case studies, uh, literally, of global mental health and action. And also, especially, I want to acknowledge that three of them were actually from North America. I, I think it really goes back to the point I made earlier that as far as mental health is concerned, 
every country has a lot to do uh, in order to actually uh, address um, huge gaps in quality of care. So the question I really had for my North American colleagues really was, how do you engage, in, in, the, in the developing world, we have very little um, pushback as it were, that comes from specialists because there aren't any uh, or there are very few and most of them are so incredibly busy uh, with the few numbers that are there that one can work with public systems and very rapidly start in innovating in the ways that you've heard. But I wondered, what, what is your experience of engaging the specialist community, which is so important um, within the North American context? Great question. Who wants to try, Vicky or Daisy? Who wants to go first? Uh, I'm happy to, to start, uh, although uh, we didn't challenge that aspect in, in our work. Um, what we did find challenge from is the usual service providers that were committed to delivering, uh, the, for example, the supportive housing models that they were used to and they, they liked, they were familiar with and comfortable with. So we had to work collaboratively, to, we had to work uh, to lobby government, we were successful actually to um, make sure that more than $600 million were invested federally in Housing First, but that was not without bruises and bruising uh, with the systems of power that had to do with the usual care system. Um, when we talk about specialists versus non-specialists, I think it's not only about training our community providers and our peers. And we had to do a lot of that and provide the supervision and support on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think we need to go deeper and address uh, how professional identity formation happens in our schools, whether it's a school of social work or medicine um, or other disciplines. I think this is where the problems start. People heal through relationships and what we teach are the people that we then hire to deliver interventions is, is hierarchy and imbalance and the power of professional knowledge. And it will require such a drastic shift and I'm not sure I'd know how to start rather than deconstruct the whole way we're training people uh, and making sure that uh, we train individuals that are prepare to share power, to give, up, to give up power. And that goes not only for the first line, for the, those on the fr uh, front line, but also for the, the leaders that would design systems of care. It, it's at their level too that they need to give up power and I'm, I'm not sure that people are ready. I think that was a great point. I can actually add to that, you know, when you talk about pro professional identity, one of the biggest challenge I had starting off in mental health and in Thrive is that I would introduce myself as a social worker and that often had like a little bit of a cloud over it compared to the other folks who were in the room and saying, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a psychologist, I'm a DV, MD, BBB, whatever. <laughs> and I would be like, I would just be like, okay, hi, yeah, masters, two years, that was me. But, um, I think that that's critical. And then often uh, my perspective, is, which is very much practice-based and on the ground and at the, on the, on the, in the community, um, was looked at as like a tertiary kind of uh, non-scientific um, contribution to the conversation. So what we, what we did with that in mind, with a couple of things in mind, one, we wondered how are black psychiatrists, psychologists, and you know, MDs across um, the city of New York feeling about the way that they're viewed, including, you know, DSWs, doctors of social work and others. And we do these massive, um, we did these, we did convenings essentially where we were essentially buy, building buy-in and doing some brain picking at the same time to get a sense of what was, where was the system failing from their perspective and how were they, and where what were the opportunities and then what were they experiencing in terms of their professional identity at, at work, which is why I even chose to wear this shirt, which oftentimes um, which is a collaboration, which is lots of different fabrics across Western um, Africa, from across Western Africa. But one of the things that we found was that even wearing something like this or having my hair braided or having an Afro is still today, even though it seems like an age old conversation, something that knocks you down and what's per, how you're being perceived as professional. And these doctors and psychologists and, and leaders in social work fields were experiencing the same things in practice. And so what they were looking to do to, to contribute to evolving the way people experience mental health in their, in their um, institutions or hospitals were often undervalued. And so we had to do 
do some work with them, healing work with them, and then kind of get to the science of how we can improve practice. I'm not sure how you manage that, Takesha, but in any case, uh, great question, Vikram. And um, I would say there's, there's two things that have really helped facilitate the conversation with specialists. Um, one is a shared goal. So the one thing that um, everyone shares a vision about is they want to improve access to quality treatments. And without that shared goal in mind among this huge range of stakeholders that are involved with at least our PCORI project here in North America, PCORI funded project here in North America, this project would not be a success. So it's about bringing people who have very different opinions, um, as I've learned in, in, global, in the global south, uh, to the same table and having conversations about, and sometimes difficult conversations about what will this look like and what might this mean for the results that we anticipate to find in, in five years time. Um, and the second thing is uh, ensuring that even if we have stakeholders at the table, ensuring that all stakeholders uh, work collaboratively, but also um, that all types of stakeholders have a voice. So not necessarily advocating for the MD, PhD, blah, 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 um, to only have a voice at the table, but to ensure that our patient advocates, our patient uh, our, and our patient um, stakeholders have an equal voice. And I think that's, this has been uh, really, really helpful in terms of getting this project off the ground. I'll just um, comment. I'm not sure if this is, oh, this is working. Um, I think, you know, when I'm thinking through some of the work that we're doing, um, what really comes to mind is that uh, there's such limited um, expertise at this time in terms of Indigenous <coughs> communities um, for us to be able to draw on. And, uh, you know, for example, like I, I can think of like the four um, First Nations psychologists that we have in Ontario, and uh, we, we continually go to them, whether we're talking about adapting CBT or, or various different types of um, initiatives and projects. And so there's an element that, um, you know, those that have acquired those types of skill have a keen interest um, in being part of these larger you know, projects, discussions that would improve um, practices and processes, you know, that really address our health outcomes. And I think that as, um, you know, we play a role within the system. And so what our role then could be is to really help create those spaces um, where people can come together in a way that is not kind of administratively um, heavy or a burden on themselves, that they're compensated for um, their time appropriately um, and adequately. And, and I think about even some of the differences um, of the mental health interventions, um, whether they're, you know, interventions that have been developed from the ground up based on um, First Nations kind of worldviews and thoughts, um, or whether they're culturally adapted. And when we look at the work that has been done um, south of us in the United States, um, there are uh, many more, I would say, opportunities and options. And one of the reasons why is that they, because of their funding model, they have hundreds of Native American psychologists um, to not only offer out clinical treatment, but to participate in really important kind of research initiatives that bring about um, new models of care. In Canada, we're just not there yet. So I think that as a system, um, those are also areas that we can look at um, to address in these, some of these gaps. Okay, maybe I'll turn to the audience now. So the trick with the microphones is press the microphone button. If it's flashing, don't say a word. Your turn to talk will be when the light stays on. So please press the buttons and it'll go in order as to when you press the buttons, like a game show. <laughs> All right. So questions from the audience. Yours is stable. Go ahead, sir. I guess I won the button pressing race there. Um, you spoke at the start about how there's needs in every country. The International Committee of the Red Cross earlier this month spoke about the needs in humanitarian crisis and spoke about how people in conflict zones have three times the rate of needs. And I wonder if anybody on the panel had any comment on that or, or, or if, if, if you felt like the global mental health space is, is spending enough effort to address people places like Syria and Yemen, DR Congo that are affected by conflict. So press the button to turn it off. Thank you very much. So I, uh, from my own perspective, I, I haven't actually had uh, the opportunity personally to work in that kind of context. But what I will say is that if anything, the humanitarian sector has actually been the single biggest 
uh, platform for delivery of interventions uh, for addressing mental health and psychosocial issues. Um, and that's because historically, that's been actually the first sector that was recognized uh, as a development priority. Um, so the, the response, for example, to the tsunami in Sri Lanka or the Balkans war, for example, both of which are, you know, the global south in many ways, um, the, the response in the humanitarian setting was very strongly acknowledging mental health well before any other uh, sector uh, uh, was acknowledging it. I think where these two communities have been very separate and they're coming together now, which is very good, um, was the focus on certain kinds of mental health issues in the humanitarian sector. I'm sure all of you know, there was a very heavy focus on post-traumatic stress disorder. This often led to a very particular kind of orientation. Um, there was also a fairly Northern-led response and very little attention to capacity building so that you had this kind of concern that many people expressed that they were disaster junkies. People went in, did trauma counseling, and then they went to the next disaster. Uh, and so there's been a huge movement in both communities to come together, have some common values and principles. Um, and so, for example, in the humanitarian sector, there is no reason why the clinical intervention should be different from the non-humanitarian sector. For example, if you're treating TB, it doesn't matter whether you're treating TB uh, in, 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 a, in a disaster zone or whether you're treating TB in some other setting. So the question is how rather than the what. And that is really a very important progress that's happening now. And I think you're referring to the meeting in the Netherlands, I guess, uh, uh, the high-level ministerial meeting that was held there last month. So, yeah, you see, it ain't going to work. Sorry. So I'll go uh, to the question over there. Hi. Um, it seemed to me that there must be traditional knowledge and traditional practices and traditional culture around mental health that we could all learn from. And as far as I noticed, only Dr. Linklater touched on it and didn't really delve into it. Do you have any comments about um, culture that's being overwhelmed but has knowledge, practice, experience that we could all learn from? Sure. Um, thank you, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say now, I mean, it's, it's a really exciting time right now, actually, because I think that there are a lot of initiatives that are bringing forward culture um, as treatment, um, if you will. And uh, there, one example that's just coming to the top of my mind is the First Nations Mental Wellness Framework. And so that's something that um, you can find if you just Google. And that was led by Thunderbird Partnership Foundation. But there's, um, I would say, um, a new way of thinking through um, some of the way that we would do treatment kind of at the, um, not only community level, but at the hospital, you know, um, at hospitals as well. For example, at KMH, we have a sweat lodge. Um, we have ceremony grounds that we opened up three years ago. So we incorporate culture right into patient care, um, you know, through, so through assessment. It might be determined that um, the patient might um, benefit from being involved with uh, our traditional healer, um, having an Indigenous therapist, whether they're connected with Aboriginal services or in one of our other inpatient units. And I think that um, there is a, a wealth of now research um, that is kind of in the, the public domain to be able to address um, and provide examples of how culture is being used. Um, you know, and so this can be even like land-based uh, treatment programs um, that are really helpful for mental health, um, substance use issues where um, you know, there, there might be a 28-day program. So maybe modeling after um, some of the other system programs that we have, and it might blend um, you know, cultural knowledge with Western practices. Um, but be able to do, uh, say, group processing in a sweat lodge um, rather than in a, a clinical treatment room. Um, be able to take um, clients and patients out on the land to be able to sit, um, for example, by a tree if they're feeling extremely distressed. Um, it's the first line of action rather than, um, you know, medication in that way. And so I think that that's, you know, it's a great time to be asking these kind of questions because, you um, there's certainly a number of um, you know, areas where we have developed really strong practices in this way. Let me refine my question a bit. That was a very good answer to not quite the question I meant. I meant, are there things that other people can learn from not, from not treating people of a culture with that culture's methods, but cross-cultural learning? Like there's wisdom 
in all cultures, and it sh I would hope and speculate it might be transferable. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's, um, there are a lot of, I think, areas in traditional knowledge that, that cross many different cu um, cultures, many different indigenous populations. And when we think about it, um, you know, there are indigenous people, as I mentioned, from, from all around the world, right? With, and when we think about what some of those traditional practices are that uh, may have changed through different forms of colonization um, and evolution, um, you know, as we've kind of developed more formally structured medical systems. But I think that going back to some of those basics um, around human values, that, uh, that that's where we'll really see the commonality. And I think that when we think about um, patient-centered care, um, that's something to me is a, is a spiritual practice. Um, whether people use that language or not, um, you know, it, I think it just kind of sits with what, what, what they're comfortable with. And I think that, you know, as we look to some of the work that we're doing, um, even in the more kind of mainstream system, that we could likely find um, roots that that might come from some commonalities amongst Indigenous knowledge if that helps come through. I think that, I mean, there's another area around cultural competency, right? And I think that, you know, that area really emerged from um, practitioners understanding that they needed more information to be able to provide treatment to someone of a different culture. And so those kind of roots come from understanding their self-location, um, what their own knowledge base is, and understanding the power that they might hold um, but also being able to demonstrate skill, um, you know, with actual examples about how their practice has, um, you know, expanded to be um, more accommodating to different cultures as well. Vicky, did you want to? Uh, very briefly, you, you're correct in that we didn't teach, um, we didn't uh, talk about it in any great length um, because of the demographics in Toronto and the high prevalence of ethno-racial and racialized communities here, we actually did take culture into account. Uh, one of our study arms was a team that was working explicitly from an anti-oppression, anti-racism framework. But then we taught all teams about some of the basics um, on, on how to deliver care from that framework, on uh, how do, do we engage with the participants to, uh, to, to ensure that any services that were offered as a choice were holistic and according to their cultural beliefs. So there was a very intentional effort, but, but you're correct, and, and we should be talking more about uh, the work that needs to go to serve uh, populations and communities that, have, uh, that are so diverse. I just, just wanted to uh, make a quick point about uh, the cross-cultural learnings. A lot of the work that we do uh, in India when we're developing our interventions is around understanding people's explanatory models around the particular um, disorder or, or illness that we are uh, looking at. And what we have increased, what we are increasingly finding is, is, is that uh, even people who have not come into contact with any kind of uh, Western um, intervention, so to say, um, use their, uh, through their native intelligence, use strategies which match a lot with things that are within structured interventions. So the labeling might be different, but there is an ex existence within cultures of things that can naturally translate into what are evidence-based strategies. So, so there are kind of existing examples of these kind of cross-cultural learnings. It's just what we call them and what we label them is. To add to that, I think we run a risk of westernizing or like white, I, I don't mean to say whitewashing in that way, but like making something that has a unique cultural design. Um, it's maybe working. I think it's working. Hello? Uh, Sorry. You're okay. I think it's okay. We can just. Okay. Um, one of the things is, I think sometimes when we try to formalize cultural practices into something that is evidence based um, or scientificize <laughs> something like social building social ties or cooking a meal together or learning how to make porridge, um, I think that practice. It, it, it can disassociate a person from the innate healing power that is inside of that cultural practice. So I think there is some 
healing and um, building access and in individuals to what is most humanly universal um, that may be more that may be more necessary so that recognition of any cultural practice that is healing for another person as a practice for like treatment um, it becomes more natural but when we codify practices based off of this hierarchy of professionalism in, in that space, sometimes we lose the, the nature of it. You know, we, we lo lose the applicability of it. And not saying that that's what you were trying to say at all, but saying that there is some human connectivity work that we need to do in general, some human acknowledgement and recognition work that we need to do that might allow us to see how saying, hey, what's up, or que lo que, or, you know, manishma, or dume la ma, any other kind of thing, how it inherently in the design of that context, that language, creates a certain connectivity to the person hearing it. And sometimes going inside and kind of finding how this neuron connects to that neuron after you hear that word, um, kind of breaks it down into the space that I think makes it less powerful. I think if we can just value people more, then you would be able to see how the way a person is interacting over a porridge pot or sharing a bowl of rice um, creates healing naturally, and then we would create more opportunities for that type of interaction. We have two minutes left. We've got one question, so a short question and a short answer, please. Hi, um, I'm wondering if you guys have any suggestions for students or young professionals um, coming from a privileged North American educational background to get involved in global health and global mental health research opportunities or internships within low resource settings. Um, specifically, how can we stay engaged while working from our inherently Western and privileged positions? Go. <laughs> Just go. Like. I jumped in, like I jumped into the field. Like I spent a lot of time, I didn't spend a lot of years working on a PhD, but I spent a lot of years practicing. So I've worked all around the world and I worked for free. I worked, I lived in people's houses. I, you know, I didn't, I did what I could to get the on the ground experience. And I didn't do everything trying to write a paper. I did more, I did, sometimes that creates, if you're trying to build your accolades at the same time where you're trying to learn, sometimes it creates a little bit of a, dis, a disconnect I would say go out and get as much experience on the ground as possible and do it in the most authentic and natural way. Um, and, and, don't, and, and you might not be able to get paid for a while. <laughs> like, you know, and it, it definitely impacts your career trajectory, I guess, in terms of you know, what, you're, what you're looking to make or earn, but it's never gonna compare to what you earn inside of yourself and what you, how much you grow as a human being. So I would say just go write letters and tell people you want to help them in their office and then just go and figure out how you're going to get yourself together and live. <laughs> but just go. Every nation needs it. And there's lots of cities across the country, I'm sure, in Canada and in the United States that could just use somebody on the ground learning and helping and contributing. So, Vikram, I think it's fitting you have the last word and the answer to that question. Well, I'm not that young anymore, so I was hoping that Takisha and Daisy and others would uh, would actually address that. Um, so I, I just wanted to say what a privilege it is to be with younger researchers here. Um, I, 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 wanna, I want to congratulate you for your interest in the field. And I tell you what, these, this question is not only true for global mental health, it's true for global health more generally. The question of how do I find time and resources? Uh, how do I engage with this other place while I'm also trying to complete my higher education or trying to get a faculty appointment or whatever stage of the career you're in? And I think the Keisha is actually right. You don't have to go very far to find disparities. Um, I think you can get stuck into addressing disparities in your backyard, and there are always disparities in your backyard. And then as the time emerges and you acquire skills and confidence about working with social determinants and disparities, then you will find that your knowledge base is very valuable to actually share with others in other parts of the world. But I would do I always emphasize to my students in Harvard, global health is not about going to Rwanda. It's going to the neighborhood next door, which actually doesn't have the same services that you enjoy. Well, on behalf of um, all of us here, including the Gardner Foundation, SICKA Center for Global Child Health, SICKA's Research Institute, CAMH, and Grand Challenges Canada, thank you for the speakers. 
Thank you for the panelists and thank you for the audience. I might say that in order for us to be successful in the sustainable goal number three, which is the health goal, we have to address global mental health. We've identified some of the challenges today and I think the advantages of going from global to local. So you've done your job well. Thank you so much.